consumers are still spending. And on top of that, you're getting some relief on the pricing side. If they continue to spend and add to their debt levels, that could slow things down. The trajectory over the longer run is that inflation should start to gradually decline over the coming months. That resilience, growth, story can run. I don't think a recessionary threat is immediate. I think we will slow, but I don't think this is an economy that's at any imminent threat of anything really bad happening. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, live on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P 500, slightly negative after another day of gains on the S&P 500. Just squeezed one out yesterday out, yeah. after the biggest day of gains since April, the previous day. TK, we should begin on the West Coast, playing happy families in San Francisco, California. Yeah, and then there were some comments late in the press conference we'll get to all that today but pretty much on script i mean photo op photo op photo op big fancy room they had to find i thought it was in the movie mank mank came out a couple years ago william randolph hearst and i thought oh it's a set of mank <laughs> we're playing no, happy families they reach for yeah. the thermostat they turn the heat down yeah. it's all good tk it's, it's great good. china's even going to send the pandas back to american zoos <laughs> wonderful Perfect. Cosmetic level stuff and then bang. He's a dictator. Well, the president yeah. of the United States. Just kind of spoiling the party a little bit. Just to put this into perspective, someone asked him, does he stand by his comments made several months ago that Xi Jinping was a dictator? And Biden said, well, look, he is. I mean, he's a dictator in the sense that he's a guy who runs a country that is a communist country that is based on a form of government totally different from ours. You know, here's the question. Does China take this up? and actually run with it, or do they ignore it? That actually will set the tone for just how much they want to have this be a success, at least in the backward look. The bar is so low for this relationship, TK, that I think it wouldn't take much to really jump over that bar. And we took a hopper, skip, and a little bit of a jump yesterday evening It was over a little bit of a jump. I, I'm sorry. I would suggest it was all given back by, and I don't know the peculiarities of how the president addressed the dreaded D word, but... I think it was, I, I have to believe, how offended can various and sundry people representing the Chinese be? And I know there's a lot of Americans like, well, we don't care if they're offended, but they're offended. Away from that, let's talk about the business meeting that did take place. We can tell you who was on Xi's table, Tom, at the dinner. Yeah. Apple CEO, Tim Cook. No surprise. BlackRock leader, Larry Fink, Blackstones, Stephen Schwartzman. Big table, Bramo, still going through the list. There's about 20 names on it, based on what I saw <laughs> overnight. Do you think there's anything that the Chinese leader could say to these guys today that would make them invest more tomorrow? I gave so much thought to this last night. I was thinking about that. Do you take promises? Do you take tone? Do you take happy families? Do you take the pandas that are coming back to you as zoos? Or do you basically say, essentially, we've seen what we've seen. We cannot be dependent on any kind of policy stability. We're going to continue shifting okay. away from this country. And, you know, it's nice to see and be seen, but unless they have to do business, Hard to get some confidence. The headline from Reuters two days ago, Gang says ICBC paid ransom over a hack that disrupted U.S. Treasury markets. So maybe Secretary Fink leaned across the hors d'oeuvres and said, how about that, ICBC? You think that came up yesterday? <laughs> I don't know. One story I noticed that Elon Musk had his own separate small gathering, Bramo, with President Xi. He didn't go to the big event. There was a smaller smaller meeting. Oh, I love this. The sort of <laughs> tears. It's like if you're, you know, a gold member, you get to go to this special one with Xi Jinping. He has had a cozier relationship with Xi Jinping in many oh, ways. And he also relies more on that market. You've got to make a distinction between finance and capitalism in the transactional modern age in manufacturing something in China. Cook manufactures in China, even if it's indirectly. I believe Musk is not even indirectly. It's a direct Tesla manufacturing in Shanghai. A big These focus of the conversation different. this morning, TK. We'll continue this in just a moment. <clears throat> Lots of retailers reporting this morning. Lisa's going to go through some of the names and the times those numbers drop. Let's start with the equity market on the S&P 500. Equity futures shaping up as follows. Equity futures totally unchanged. Just about squeezed out a day of gains yesterday on the S&P 500 after a <clears throat> big move the previous day. Yields are a little bit lower, Tom. It's a break of 450. Dare I say you might have some stability yeah. at 4.5% on a 10-year. In the yield space, maybe that's where we are, 45 Zero, zero, zero. I first thing I did when I came in, I didn't look at a chart today, folks. I looked at levels. I got Dow 35,000, 4,500 SPX. I'm not to 16,000 yet, NASDAQ 100. But to your point, I think it's key yesterday that we held up 
off of the shock and awe of a couple of days ago. It's a quiet morning so far. Yeah. The Euro just about unchanged at 108.50. Bramo, the morning gets busier as the morning grows older. And it gets busier with the consumer. And I actually think retail earnings matter more than ever in this particular earnings cycle. We did just get Bath and Body, uh, and we saw a bit of a miss on the full year forecast. We can go through that in a minute. We get Macy's as well uh, coming up at 6.55 a.m. 7 a.m., we get Walmart after the Bell Ross stores and Gap. It's important to see where we've come so far this year. Macy's shares are down 37% so far this year, the second year of double-digit losses. Walmart shares are up 21%. So how much do we learn with respect to the earnings about specific companies versus overall trends of a consumer? We'll get into that in a bit uh, with a couple other names. 8.30 a.m., we get U.S. initial jobless claims as well as some housing market data at 10 a.m. How initial jobless claims have ticked up, the unemployment rate has steadily ticked up. If we start to see a real increase, a surprise in the initial jobless claims, I'm curious about the market reaction. Today, let's go through the Fed speak. I know you've been looking forward to it. Boys. We've got Michael Barr, the <clears throat> uh, vice chair for supervision, Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester. Retiring. New, yes, indeed. New York Fed President John Williams, Fed Governor Chris Waller. Interesting. As well as Fed Governor Lisa Cook. There is a Treasury market conference being hosted by the New York Fed. Today. That sounds fun, doesn't it? I think actually right now, a lot of people would say that this counts as fun because this is actually a huge yeah. dynamic. Mary market. Daly with Kelby Smith. Yes. In uh, the Financial yeah. Times yesterday, Tom. Yeah, I saw that. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I, too, too early to declare victory. Yeah, I think it's, she's my most, my mo I've said this before, she's my favorite Fed uh, president. I think she's got a huge understanding of the fabric of America, and particularly in America. It's struggling. What I love about Bath and Body Works, and I know it's not a Dow component, but the beard and scruff cream there is, you can't, it's like the best. That's what you got to buy. The, the beard okay. and scruff cream is. Thanks great. for sharing that with yes, us, Tom. Thank you. I appreciate it. Couldn't it's have our coverage of Bath. Can we check out Burberry just quickly? Bye. That stock is down by 9.4%. <clears throat> over in European trading in London, down 9.4% because sales barely grew no. in the last quarter and the outlook's not looking bright. Let's put it that way. 1580 over in London. Joining us now is Sophie Lund Yates, lead equity analyst at Hargreaves Landown. Sophie, let's go straight to Burberry and great to have you with us on the program as always. Does this signal the end of the post-pandemic boom? Yes. What are we returning to? Sophie, I don't know. What do you think we're going back to? Hi, good morning. Yes, this is obviously the very big, big read this morning. Burberry really quite, quite disappointing. Um, and I think we can't necessarily conflate the entire um, luxury side of things to purely these results. Burberry has got a, a really specific set of challenges and within that opportunities as well. For Burberry, I think that we are going to be coming back to a, to a lower base than pre-pandemic, um, to be completely frank. Um, but within that, you know, it's done a huge amount of work on its creative turnaround, you know, repositioning itself at the higher end of that value chain. Um, so that should cushion it slightly. Um, but actually, I think when you look at product range, the breakdown of the demographic that they're going after, I think that there are, frankly, just a lot more challenges for them to, to clear. Um, and that's why I think the growth run runway does look a little bit more problematic to me. So, Sophie, how does your outlook look for next year if we understand that each and every stock has a narrative like Burberry? Everybody has an individual story. How do you coalesce those many corporate stories into a market call? It's certainly a challenge. You know, I can't really think of a time when there's been quite this much divergence as, as well, really. You know, it's certainly it's certainly a dynamic time, isn't it? Um, I think for me, if we keep it with within within luxury, um, it's really for me, it's, it's going back to those old school tactics um, and understanding kind of the, the best in class offerings and breaking breaking that down um, because, you know, things have become so segregated, so polarized in a lot of situations or actually just saying, oh, this, this sector looks reasonably OK or this sector looks reasonably challenged is no longer, um, is no longer good enough. So it's looking at best in class propositions um, and always, always, as you know me, coming back to that valuation point and remembering that price is what you pay and value is what you get. And that is something that, that really cannot be forgotten, particularly as we head into next year, which I think is going to be um, really quite a bumpy ride no matter where you look in the market. Let's talk about where that, those bumps will come from. Is there any conclusion we can draw about which which buyers are pulling back on the consumer space, uh, affecting specific retailers, but not so much other ones? 
Sure. For me, I think a particularly squeezed area is going to be those retailers that are in, that are in the, the middle of the value chain. Um, and by that, I mean those that aren't super high end uh, and those that aren't offering um, consumer um, discounts and, and extra good value. So that non-essential and discretionary spend um, is going to be really quite quite challenging. Um, in the short term, there, is, there are some bright spots. I don't want to just um, come on here and be all doom and gloom. Uh, you know, when we look at holiday spending, for example, we know that you know we're looking at a holiday spending pullback in probably mid single digit um, percentages but within that e-commerce growth is expected to come through the line and there are particular retailers amazon one i think is actually particularly well um, placed to capitalize on that in the short term um, but broadly speaking going into next year those those companies you were talking about macy's earlier i think they're in a difficult spot those kind of large scale physical retail estates that are offering kind of mid to higher mid value options for consumers have got a really hard job on their hand to try and convince people to spend with them in a big way how much has already been priced in i think a lot of it um i think that the possibility of very sharp falls obviously never um, never never a definite no but I think they are probably less likely but I think we could see an incremental creep downwards still um, for for those names um, and obviously I do think in some situations um, for example I'm not entirely sure how sustainable um, targets recent rally is given their um, leaning towards the, the non-essential spend as well. Um, so we could still see some corrective moves, but I think for me, it may be more like a creep downwards. Sophie, it's interesting listening to you because over the last couple of days, all we've heard is happy talk regarding the equity market and a big year-end rally that's about to evolve over the next month or so. I don't hear that from you, Sophie. What do you like in equities right now? Yeah, sure. I obviously need some more some more coffee. I'm, I'm not in a good mood on the markets today, clearly. Um, there are definitely some some big opportunities. Um, I do think that certain corners of of luxury um, do do remain relatively compelling. Um, but looking at kind of some maybe some slightly less exciting names for me, I think the um, the telecoms, particularly um, some of the big names in Europe. Um, have some interesting propositions. They're not the most exciting stocks, but that's you know that's why um, some of them are interesting. You know those incredibly wide economic moats and and, and those barriers to entry um, and that reliability of demand are all very exciting things to me in the current environment. And um, at the same time, I think some of the big um, aerospace defence players um, also were looking at a lot of chatter around energy transition, particularly in nuclear as well. Um, so you look at the likes of Rolls Royce and some of the opportunities there. Um, again, it all comes down. Down to those wide economic moats um, for me is, is where we need to be, is where we need to be looking. Sophie, always enjoy catching up with you. Thanks for being with us. Sophie Lundiage there of Hargreaves Lansdowne. Just to go back to Burberry, Tom, <laughs> down 9% today, yeah. down close to something like 20% year to date. It's been the, absolutely brutal. The, Remember what this yeah. year was meant to be? China reopening, consumers are coming back. Yeah. It's going to support some of these names. LVMH off to the moon and then rolled it over aggressively. And, and now there's going to be a separation out here. I'm really not sure where LVMH fits into that separation out. There's others. We've got Deborah Aiken and Bloomberg Intelligence doing great work on that. My issue with it from a Burberry family a million years ago is real simple. In most of luxury, including Burberry, when I walk in the store, nothing fits. Trench coats? You'd think they'd have a trench coat that fits me. Are you describing Not personal a, problems? Or yeah, it's do you think personal. this is a broader issue I've for the I've talked to Steve Sadov of it, who invented the word exclusive within American retailing at Saks Fifth Avenue, now at MasterCard in a senior position. And Steve says this is the biggest product mix, miss of luxury, is they don't do triple zeros for uh, smaller uh, females and they don't do the large thing. I, I just looked on the website. I got a trench coat all picked out, you know. They don't We've got a nice solution size. to Burberry stock. They need to make trench coats for men who are seven foot, Bramo. <laughs> that's, that's, that's how you turn this around. Glad hey, that we had value add this morning. You loved <laughs> my look at Jackson Hole two years ago. It's in a big my fan, Burberry yeah. trench coat. Who was sure. that again? That was Colombo. Yeah. <laughs> From New York City. Good morning. <laughs>
how that can be used earlier in the year. Well, look, he is. I mean, he's a dictator in the sense that he, he is a guy who runs a country that is a communist country that based on what the former government told him different than ours. The President of the United States speaking to the press after several hours of meeting with China's President Xi Jinping. You can just imagine Secretary Blinken's face, Tom, front row, as those words come from the President of the United States. I have to say, it's hard to argue against what he's saying, though, TK. Isn't it as um, close to a statement as fact that you can possibly get? I would go back to 1949. I'm looking right now in the famous Bloomberg Terminal. September 29th, 1949 is pretty much when you established an understanding of a form of government in China. We've seen that word used, but I don't think we've seen it used over fancy China and silverware at a, at a get together. But well, you've got a leader now in China that is basically <clears throat> serving a life term, Tom. Can serve for as long as he likes. And in Russia as, as well, long as he we wishes. So, as well. I mean, what is that by definition? I, I take your point. You know, I, I, I really think you have to. I mean, you know, there's niceties. I mean, if you look at a holiday gathering at the Bramo House, I mean, there's just things that aren't said. Right? Well, that aside, that aside, other than that, it was that warm embrace we all expected. Yeah. We were looking for a charm offensive from the Chinese leader because he's got obvious problems in the domestic economy. And Lisa, that's what we got in the last 24 hours. And some of the uh, most underplayed developments, I think, was the resumption of military communications because this could avoid some sort of accident that a lot of people were worried about in South, in South, the South China Sea <coughs> could ignite some bigger conflagration. No, we'll have to see. Years ago, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, in their fantastic, fantastic collection of clothing, you would walk down the stairs into the basement, and there standing at you was one of the very few fully extant uniforms of the Chinese Cultural Revolution, think 1968, and all that went on in the politics and tragedy of China. Wendy Schiller is expert at China, director of Taubman Center for American Politics, this at Brown University, and joins us this morning. Wendy, as far as I'm concerned, and I can't say I saw Ms. Madam Chiang Kai-shek speak to the House of Representatives, but we are living, whether we want to or not, our ghosts, our memories of what we think China was. Is China now what we think it was once? Well, I mean, I think there's been, it, it's uh, schizophrenic. You know, I think the great hope of giving China preferred uh, trade status or most favored nation status permanently uh, 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, was that it would open up some political freedom and that it would become a more stable and more predictable partner to the United States economically and reduce the threat politically from China. Uh, we just haven't seen that kind of political freedom ever really develop in China. And instead, it became a gigantic, not only trading partner, but competitor, and some would say purveyor, let's just put it nicely, of American technology and creative ideas. So I think we are grappling with what we thought would happen. Uh, the Democrats and the Republicans joined again their kumbaya to make this happen under Bill Clinton and what's actually happened in that country. Right. And I think if there's, there's great disappointment that there hasn't been a, a more a progression, a Hamiltonian progression towards uh, yeah, more but, political freedom. Yeah, well said, but Hamiltonian, Alexander Hamilton's not showing up for the debate. Either is John <laughs> Locke. How much is Xi like Mao? He wants to be like Mao. I don't know who Putin wants to be like, maybe Peter the Great. But if you look at the memory that China has of Mao, how much do you see Mao in that dictatorship in the present China? Well, this is really about um, not letting sort of global changes, particularly informational changes, access to technology, access to information, disrupt the sort of firm political order. But he's allowed far more freedom, you could argue, in life itself in China, in development. You know, you don't have to wear the same clothes as everybody else. Uh, speaking of the luxury good market, right, in China, this seems small, but it's not small. Allowing people to think that they are living life as they want to live it socially at least, or economically at least, uh, gives him more leeway to tighten the reins on political power. Did the meeting that we just saw transpire between President Biden and Xi Jinping help or hurt President Biden's re-election campaign? Well, you know, we're all counting down exhaustingly to the election that is a year away, uh, but I thought he looked pretty good. He spoke, you know, not too biden -y in terms of gaffes. Uh, and, you know, it's essential to get on a stable footing with China in terms of communication, 
uh, economic, you know, the trade war costs us both money uh, and, you know, trying to you know, curb intellectual theft. But basically, you know, Russia's we're still Russia. And now we've got the Middle East unstable. We don't need China's back up, so to speak. In addition to that, uh, you, you mentioned the South China Sea, Taiwan, you know, calming things down. And I think in that sense, that's the image I think the president conveys. Not too biden I think, is a pretty fantastic <laughs> phrase. I will just say that. Yesterday, though, uh, countering this idea of President Biden as the obvious incumbent, NBC asked Joe Manchin of West Virginia whether he would consider running for president. He said, I will do anything I can to help my country. And you're saying, does that mean you could consider it? Absolutely. He did go on to say he didn't want to see the former President Trump reelected. But how much of a liability is a Joe Manchin run to a Joe Biden second term? Well, any third party candidate that gets on the ballot, and this is so important, you know, bureaucratically, that actually gets on the ballot in enough states, particularly swing <clears throat> states, will cipher votes from Biden and Trump. Question is, how many votes from either candidate? The Trump base is small, but very loyal in the Republican Party. You know, how many more Republicans will come along with that base if it's Biden? I'm not as persuaded, Manchin, you know, takes all the votes from Biden, he could take a fair amount of votes from people who don't want to vote for Trump, uh, want somebody no. in the middle. Uh, there's other people going to be out there on the ballot. It's all really about this getting on the ballot, not just making right. an announcement that you're running for president. What's the gear we hear, Wendy? We got to go back to 1972 and Senator Muskie's tears in New Hampshire. Are we going to see tears January 23rd in New Hampshire? Once again, the Granite State front runs the Democratic Party. Yeah, and we don't even know if that will count, right, towards the, the general tally. Um, you know, New Hampshire goes tends to go blue more recently in presidential elections. So sort of picking a fight with New Hampshire doesn't seem to make all that much sense. But we know how crucial South Carolina was to Biden's win in the primary um, in uh, 2020. And it's symbolically, you know, he's sort of fading a little bit in the polls among African-American voters who tend to be quite loyal to the Democratic Party. It's one thing to be loyal. It's another to turn out to vote a year from now. So really, you know, getting that enthusiasm back up among African-American voters uh, in South Carolina as a national symbol is more important, whether it's costly to Biden in a very tight presidential race, we're, we're going to find out. Wendy, thank you. Wendy Schiller there of Brown University on the latest. Are you feeling biden -y this morning? I, it's fascinating to me. And, you know, I think just as important as all the, the you know, Amory Horton on the West Coast ballet is this New Hampshire or suddenly January 23rd is on us. It's take just around the corner, right? It's seriously around the corner when you take out the holidays and the travel. You know, I'm, what am I going to call it? Seven, like seven active weeks away from standing out. You know, you're, you're, you're standing. I, I was doing a live hit in Concord from the street and this fire engine went by, sirens and all that. And, and, and they said, what is that? And I said, that's the lone Hillary Clinton voter in celebration. <laughs> well, that's a long time ago. Biden's name will not be on the primary in New Hampshire. And I wonder if it's because he might be considered too Biden-y by some people. I mean, that, that phrase highlights some of the concerns and, frankly, the concern around the dictator comment as well. Granted, he was prompted and granted, you could argue nothing that he said was untrue. Nonetheless, you know, you could just punt and not really raise the temperature, right? I mean, this is sort of some of the questions of whether it was like the right venue. Uh, was it the right venue for that kind of question? I, I just, I get so frustrated with news conferences just like that. I heard you say it, I'm with you. What do you expect him to say? If he doesn't say it, we're gonna sit here and I'd be the first to say it. Why is he not just saying it? 100%. State it, of fact, you're was. in your home country, he's come over, we know what it is, he's serving a life term now, there are no term limits for she. Okay. By any real definition, it is what it is. I agree with you, and frankly, right. it's sort of being baited, and then everybody responding baited, to the bait baited. one way Correct. or another. John, would that have happened to Sunak in the British press? <laughs> Without a doubt, the press loves this game. They would have, they the would have asked loves the same rude it's question. Just, it's just okay. classic moronic DC politics. You know, do you still think he's a dictator? I mean, John's, like, John's that I winning it. our team. Yeah. It's not that I think it. It's just that by definition, he is. John's winning but, our team you know. political coverage. Surveillance, our classic moronic political <laughs> coverage. Let's talk bonds up next. <laughs> this is Bloomberg.
Equities on the S&P 500 just about unchanged yesterday, squeezing out a day of gains on the S&P following a monster day the day before. Right now, unchanged on the S&P, going absolutely nowhere. On the Nasdaq, negative by 0.14%. Some stability, believe it or not, in the bond market. Two-year, 10-year, 30-year, the scores look like this for Treasuries. 4.49.41. Yields are coming in about four basis points on a 10-year. All the happy talk of the last couple of days. Dan Iverson and Pimco, speaking of Bloomberg. Mm. Legendary investor over in Newport Beach, Tom. The inflation problem is far from being solved. Moving in the right direction is different than getting to the right. central bank target of 2%, give or take. We are moving in the right direction, Tom, but arriving at 2% is a very different story. We have to identify calls made 18 months ago, and PIMCO had a great house call saying, everybody calm down, we will see a lower rate regime, and maybe this is now where it really clicks in. Certainly that's a house call that, that, that they have. I look at it, John, I look at the real yield, and I'm going to call it Midland here from a 250 down to 216, back to 2.23, 2.23, and off the news, off Walmart here today, which I think is suddenly a huge deal. NVIDIA next week, I think, will be a real bellwether. You know, I don't... I'm, big, big time. I'm not knowledgeable on it, year. but, you know, these kind of earnings, you say, well, what's going to keep this thing going? And those are the kind of events. We'll get Walmart in the next 30 minutes, I believe. And then you're going to hear from Macy's and The Gap. Lisa went through some of the companies a little bit earlier. Gap yesterday. Let's finish on foreign exchange. I've got plenty of things to say about The Gap. <laughs> in the FX market right now, the euro looks like this. 108.57, that <clears throat> currency pair positive, 0.1%. Tom, the logistics, just the user experience, the e-commerce side of the gap is just so awkward and clumsy. You know, it's, just it's like, awful. It's like out of the pandemic, some of the airlines, some have succeeded at this strange word execution, and some have it. And I wonder you go into see, I wonder if the Magnificent Seven, which one of those is not going to execute? I mean, I'm not... I don't want to be but brain. you have to make it frictionless. I remember when Michael yeah. O'Leary of Ryanair would talk about the number of clicks it would take to book a flight. Yeah. We had Michael yeah, O'Leary exactly. around the table with us, and they did a great job of making it really easy. I mean, for Bramo, Amazon, it, just you know, swipe, buy, done, for, Bramo, for frictionless. Bramo, yeah, to pop business class, I mean, Bramo can do it with a couple <laughs> clicks. Yeah, although I do wonder what it means to be frictionless for the companies if people are ordering five different sizes and then going to send them all back. I mean, how do you sort of plan around people using the mail system as their personal dressing room? It just becomes a very big challenge and things are moving faster than maybe some of these companies can adapt the to. The one thing that annoys me, and I've talked to you about this before, when you go and get overnight delivery, Tom, next day delivery, and you pay up for that, <laughs> but it's next day from when they're ready to deliver it. About a year and a half So ago. you'll it's order crazy. it Monday. It's, it's crazy. And they'll be like, yeah, we haven't sent that out yet. And I'll be like, yeah, but I, I said next day delivery. And they'll send it out Friday next day. Yep. And they'll make out that they've upheld their end of the bargain. What are retailers playing at? They're playing at they can't make money on next day delivery. So they've finessed this over the last 18 months. Is that what it is? I would defer to uh, our retail powers, but it doesn't work. We'll be That's talking about the retailers work. through this morning. Under surveillance this morning. It's our top story. President Biden heading progress with China's leader Xi Jinping after meeting in San Francisco yesterday. The four-hour summit resulting in agreements to restore high-level military communications, combat fentanyl, and open a dialogue over artificial intelligence. Speaking with reporters after the meeting, Biden once again referring to Xi as a dictator, a comment that the Chinese foreign ministry called extremely wrong. A comment, Lisa, that I will acknowledge has become increasingly distracting, largely because of the way the media has responded to it. Ultimately, as you indicated, focus on the substance. There is some substance there to get your hands around. And the substance carried through even with the statement from the Chinese ministry, the, uh, the foreign ministry spokesperson of China, not only saying, yes, it's extremely wrong and irresponsible political manipulation, but then went on to say it should be pointed out that there will always be some people with ulterior motives who attempt to incite and damage U.S.-China relations, and they are doomed to fail. It seemed very clear China was not going to take this bait to go against right. what the progress was that had been made during this meeting. Dinner in San Francisco, was Speaker Pelosi there? I don't think so. Where are you That's, taking this, the no, visit to I think, Taiwan? I think to Taiwan, I think this is an elephant in the room, as the Speaker yeah. felt like a lot of Americans, let's go. And the president is backpedaling from that within the niceties of the meeting. I think President Xi said he didn't want a cold or hot war with any country. Yeah. 
does China consider Taiwan a country? Well, if you really want to read between the lines. Okay. There's also <laughs> been, it's clear that nobody wanted to fight, right? There was some conciliatory comments by China saying that they're looking for closer economic ties with Taiwan, which was a change in tone. And Taiwan is electing a member uh, to their government that actually has more China friendly feelings. So maybe the temperature is going down. I will say, though, at the same time, Congress was holding a hearing with Apple about why they canceled John Stewart's show because John Stewart uh, had some controversial comments about China and they were yeah. saying, you know, what is the self-censorship of some of these companies? So are we moving in the same direction in all parts of government? No. <laughs> no, I mean, it's Apple, it's Cancel the Walt Disney John Company. Stewart. It's, you know, take your pick. Exactly. Take, these are subjects they're so nervous about talking about because they think, Tom, they're going to lose business in mainland China. Well, they lost business. They weren't allowed to show Barbie because they didn't show the South China Sea correctly or whatever. Is that true? Yeah. They, the bar, there was a map in Barbie that didn't... I mean, I've only seen it five times. I haven't watched it There was it a yet. map in Barbie, like, you know, she's broadcasting or whatever. And, and the Chinese were very upset about the map of the South China Sea up to Taiwan. I'm not sure about that particular example, but we've seen that yeah. in many examples of movies that yeah. have come out of Hollywood. You know. Struggling to get access, Tom, into mainland China because that box office has become such a big deal to it's the business a, yeah. of some of these companies. Yeah. Yeah. Let's turn to some better news in Washington. The U.S. Senate voting overwhelmingly <coughs> to approve the House's temporary funding bill to avert a government temporary. shutdown. This delays a clash over federal spending until the new year. Not included in the bill, emergency aid to Ukraine and Israel, with Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer saying that would be the chamber's next priority. President Biden is expected to sign the measure before Friday's deadline. So, good news. We won't be talking about this tomorrow. Bad news, Bramho. We're going to be doing this in a much, much bigger way in New Year. January is one uh, a chunk of the 20% of funding that's going to come up for renewal. And then February again. is going to be 80% of the chunk of funding that has to get rid I mean, honestly, how much are we sort of cannibalizing the process later on to get it through now? And what it's going to mean is a bigger fight and more of these discussions, which we all love. I can't wait to have these discussions through the morning. Let's finish on this name. It's one that jumped out for us all this morning in London trading, Burberry, getting absolutely hammered, warning that this year's revenue target may be out of reach. Sales barely growing in the most recent quarter, shares falling as much as 11% and what is the steepest intraday decline in more than three years. It's coming as consumers worldwide are bulking at higher prices from luxury brands, signaling that the impacts of inflation are hitting across all levels of income. That stock now is down by 10.6%. I think you've got broader luxury, which is having a problem at the moment, Tom, and we can have a conversation about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And then you've got Burberry. Burberry was having a really difficult time in the 90s. Had a renaissance under Angela Arons yes. and the designer Christopher Bailey, who eventually went on to become the CEO. And Tom, ever since Arons left, which I believe was back in 2014, about 10 years ago, for me, this brand has just been going in the wrong direction. I think it's Jonathan Ackroyd now who runs the business. Tom, to try and turn this around, I, it's going to be quite difficult. Compare year-to-date Burberry, <clears throat> which is down about 20%. Put it up against your favourite brand, which is up 20%. Yeah, the I, maker of orange bow ties. You, you can and do that. And a massive I'm, I'm difference. Wearing, what do I got? I never look at the tie when I pick it out in the morning. It's pink. It's, it's, today's a pink one. This is an older one. This is like seven Lagarde meetings ago. But the answer is, 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 is Burberry is there, they've blown it up, and what's the closest analog? The closest analog is Gucci. And Keering is working overtime off the five-year gift they had in Gucci to rebuild it. Guy Labat's going, I don't wear Gucci, I don't wear Burberry, what are we going to do? <laughs> Saving the show here on our market coverage of equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. Guy Labat joins chief fixed income strategist. Jenny Montgomery Scott of Philadelphia. Guy, thank you so much for joining uh, today. It's a 450 yield on the 10-year. Just simply at a retail, high net worth level. Is that a yield that's attractive to capture right now? So I'll say here at Jenny, we're definitely seeing an increase in allocations from our retail wealth management network into the fixed income markets. A lot of it is relatively short term, however. Uh, it's big demand and the real front end of the curve with money market type instruments. And it sort of trails off as you go a little bit further. So I think there's still some caution after uh, two and a half years in round numbers of pretty big declines in bond market values. So some caution there. So at this point, Guy, uh, Guy, have we seen sort of the bulk of the carnage, right? I mean, this is sort of where we're coalescing around the stability of only 13 basis points round trip yesterday uh, in 10 year yields. Are we seeing 450 as the new level du jour that's going to stick for some time? 
Well, a couple of weeks ago, we had really big declines in yields right around the time of the FOMC meeting, the Bank of Japan announcement, the U.S. Treasury refunding. And I think those announcements effectively capped yields for 2023, uh, which is call it about 30 basis points above current levels, round numbers. Uh, however, I am concerned that in the new year, the turn from Fed rate cuts that are currently priced in back to neutral policy or even rate hikes could spur a little bit of a reversal, particularly in the five-year area of the yield curve. This actually was something uh, that Mary Daly of the San Francisco Fed really went over in that Financial Times article that John was talking about, uh, about how the stop-start policy of the Federal Reserve is something that's really important to avoid, uh, for them to be on hold or even cut and then have to hike again, mm -hmm. and that there's this real concern that people don't understand how much uh, economic heft there is right now in the United States. Do you agree with that view that right now people are over optimistic about rate cuts and that, frankly, it becomes more dangerous as we do take a look at some really solid fundamentals. Yeah, absolutely. So on the first point, I think there's as much sort of Fed psychology, Fed Kremlinology, if you will, as economic information that we need to go over. So one of the key one of the key things that the, the Powell Fed views the mistake of the 1970s was essentially declaring victory on inflation too early. And so the easy response to avoid that happening again, though the circumstances are vastly, vastly different, but the easy response to keep that from happening mm -hmm. again is, frankly, not to declare victory almost at all. Uh, and in that world in which the Fed is very hesitant to declare victory over inflation, it's hard to imagine rate cuts are forthcoming unless there's material economic downside, which we don't put it better than a 50-50 chance for mid-2024. What do you see for 2024 on total return coupon plus a gain versus just clip the coupon. I mean, how does that work out for you? Well, so our concern really is of higher longer term rates, 10 year and out area of the yield curve that's correlated with a period of unusually strong economic growth. So that would portend negative returns possibly, uh, or very low returns in the long end of the curve. We haven't sharpened our pencils for the 2024 outlook yet. It's gonna be a few weeks away, but uh, I'll be sure to say- Oh, guy, guy, stop, Guy, Guy, stop. I'd wait for December 27th for that. Oh, okay. I mean, you know, I mean- One of the purists. Slide into that. You know, I, I, I look at it, uh, Guy, as an impossible task. What does retail do here? What do people, they don't wanna be in stocks. I'm not buying Amazon, I'm not buying Walmart. I need yield. So what is, is it just a laddered approach is the only way to go now? Yes, so we've advocated as a strategy group for barbell portfolios for the last little while. Uh, you know, a substantial amount of holdings on the front end of the yield curve inside of two years, relatively little in the belly, and a little bit more on the seven to 10 year area of the yield curve. And we don't, as, as uh, advisors, go out much further than 10 years. But that barbell really allows for, in the case that economic growth does remain unusually strong for an extended period, it allows a lot of dry powder on the front end of the yield curves, bonds that are going to be coming due in the next year, next two years, to be able to deploy a little bit further out, if indeed we do get that higher yields and stronger extended economic growth. Okay, thank you, sir, for the update. Looking forward to the outlook for 2024. Keith <clears throat> Levanda of Jenny Montgomery Scott. Just look at Treasuries over the last three days or so. On Tuesday, coming off the back of that CPI report, we had a move of almost 20 basis points lower. In yesterday's session, we were almost 10 basis points higher. And this morning, Lisa, we're about four basis points lower again. What's normal? in this bond market now? It's a great question. What is it? I mean, basically the fact that we're going up and down on different days is probably more normal than just having one moonshot up. Uh, that's the normal people are hoping for. But it's a great question. And how much is this due to a lack of liquidity and positioning and, uh, you know, end of market dynamic, end of year <laughs> dynamics, not end of market. Um, maybe that's just how Although you called feel. for that. <laughs> end of days dynamic, Ramo. I know, end I've of days, seen that. I've seen right. people, you know, putting me in the Simpsons with that, you know, oh, yeah, end yeah, of yeah. days, here they, they're here coming they're here. Something yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's something I can A week ago to. this morning, the 10-year yield opened at about 448. Given everything that's Huge happened move. in the last week or so, the 10-year right now is 449. Just to get your head around some of the volatility. <laughs> it's been like a flat market for a week. It exactly. doesn't feel like no, that. No, it doesn't. At all. From New York City this morning, good morning. The United States will continue to compete vigorously with the PRC, but will manage that competition responsibly so it doesn't veer into conflict or accidental conflict. And where it's possible, where our interests are coincide, 
we're going to work together like we did on fentanyl. The President of the United States speaking to the press after meeting with China's President Xi Jinping for several hours. We're in a competitive relationship, China and the United States. It's about managing this competition going forward from here. Said this a few times over the last couple of days, just reaching for the thermostat and just taking down the heat, TK. That's yeah. what this was all about, yes. on top of a charm offensive coming from the Chinese leader and with corporate America. As you, yeah, exactly. As you mentioned, the commercial nature of this, I think, Kim, Kim. We can't say enough uh, about it. We always do surveillance corrections here when we bomb out. I bombed out this morning. I conflated China in Vietnam. China <laughs> propaganda is what Variety said. Margot emails in from Hollywood early in the morning. Margot, thank you for listening. Uh, really, really appreciate you uh, watching uh, Bloomberg surveillance. Margot makes clear it was Can we not Vietnam. call these surveillance corrections? Can we just go with like a banner that says Tom is wrong? Tom is wrong. Well, we've done like that. that for years. Do we That's all like, have to sync with you? No, no, you don't. You know. It was my... my my, my folks, it feels personal. Vietnam <laughs> was offended over the nine dash dashinish around the South China Sea. Gotcha. The, the, the I remember map. that now, yeah. Vietnam was offended. Neither of you guys saw Barbie. I actually saw Barbie. Just want to put that on the God table. No, I... He's watched Barbie. You have? Of course, oh, yes. Of course. Not. Streams it now. <laughs> Every night. Let's move on. <laughs> I will watch it. I think it's actually a really I'll, interesting. I'll give you, know, you the review. I'm looking for. I'm, I'm very much Marco's looking forward watching to that. the show. That's the headline. Is here. Marco actually watching the yes, show? Yes, watching the very show. Very cool. Thanks for watching. Okay. Early morning, LA. Equities at the moment on the S&P <laughs> slightly negative. That's not true. We're down about a tenth of one percent. <laughs> Might be true. Who knows? We're down about four basis points on a ten-year. Four forty-nine, twenty-one. And foreign exchange doing absolutely nothing on the euro. Tom, one away, forty-nine. It's going to be interesting to see. We'll watch the data here. And, of course, an economic event today. That would be Walmart's earnings. We'll go beneath the headline at data. Right now, on these important meetings, we're making jokes about it. Come on, this is important. Michael Hurston joins now, head of China Research at 22V at Research. Michael, thank you so much for briefing us this morning. What did you, what was the unexpected that you saw last night besides a dictator faux pas by the president late? What was the unexpected of the meeting? Nothing too unexpected, frankly, which I think is good. Um, maybe the Chinese readout perhaps was a bit more positive than I was expecting. And that really reflects what has been a bit of a, <clears throat> excuse me, a recalibration in China's official tone towards the U.S. over the last few weeks. But other than that, I would say no big surprises. OK, no big surprises. Great. What's next? When's the next meeting? Does the president uh, travel to China to... Uh... Uh, make it to? Well, I think that's actually a really important point, Tom, because this is basically the last high profile meeting that the two leaders are going to have before the next U.S. presidential election. So this kind of sets the parameters for the next year. And those parameters really are trying to find stability, not allowing a crisis to take place over something like Taiwan and then just making incremental progress on some of the key issues in the relationship. But if you think about it, the closer we get to the US presidential election, the harder it will be for Biden to do anything that's seen as being soft on China. And of course, why would Xi Jinping make concessions to the US when he doesn't know who the next president will be? So I think that's where we are. That's why this was kind of an important window for the two leaders to meet. Did the dictator comment mean anything to you? Not really. I don't want to dismiss it entirely. I think it probably was perhaps uh, not the positive tone to go out on. But I think in the grand scheme, given how much work both sides did to try to make this meeting happen, I don't think it's going to color too much on the Chinese side. What did you make of the meetings uh, that Xi Jinping had with U.S. executives, Apple's Tim Cook, for example, a whole host of others, and then a private meeting with Elon Musk? What's your takeaway of how different the business view on China is from the U.S. government's view on that country? I think there are a few very prominent U.S. firms that have this special position in China, where, and that we put Apple and Tesla very much as the two bellwethers in that category. They have managed this straddle between the US and China. It's not an easy straddle on either side, but they're in kind of a special category. If you look at the you know broader set of US firms in China, it's really a mix between those who feel like they have a decent market in China and those who are really um, upset about China's policies. Um, and so I, I would put 
Tesla and Apple in this kind of special category. And so it's no surprise that they got some special attention from Xi Jinping. Do you have a sense of who needs who more? of whether Tesla and Apple need China more than China needs them and the jobs that they provide? It's, a, it's an interesting question. I would say for the companies, they need, app, they need China more. But if we're talking about Apple and Tesla, they are very important bellwethers for how the business community looks at the playing field in China and not just the US business community, that's Europeans, uh, Japanese, you know, global companies in China which is why I think Beijing actually has to tread very carefully with things like, for example, potential reta retaliation against Apple. So yeah, the companies need China more, but these are quite important as Xi Jinping mm. looks to try to revive confidence in China's economy and China's investment environment. Michael, a question we haven't brought up yet, I've been remiss on this, is Hong Kong, can do it? Is Hong Kong going to evolve into something that we don't see right now? Is there, is there a Herson Hong Kong out there that's going to be different? I think Hong Kong really, and I, I was just there last week, is in this somewhat gradual transition from a global hub to really more of a pure capital gateway to China and is increasingly becoming more of a Chinese city. That is still an interesting position for it to play. And a number of China watchers that I've had discussions with recently have made the point that they think Hong Kong is going to remain an interesting city as the political environment in China stays very tight and in some cases even tightens further. So Hong Kong losing its status as a global financial center, but still quite an important um, city in the context of, uh, right. in, in particular, in context of China. So what's the alternative for those people whining and dining with uh, Mr. Xi last night? What city do they go to? I think if we're talking about the financial sector, it you know it's a number of places. Singapore obviously has has gained a step. Even Tokyo has become more important as a regional financial center. If we're talking about the multinationals, there you know it's wherever they can get capacity and wherever they can get the logistics right. So in many cases, as you you know you mentioned Vietnam earlier, Vietnam yes, is prime beneficiary, but it's also Mexico. It's a lot of countries. Michael, we've got to leave it there. Thanks for being with us, Michael Herson there of Twenty Two V Research. Thank you very much. These changes, Bramo, are already happening. This is the problem. It comes from both sides. It's not just about the relationship and what the United States is responsible for. The lack of clarity and visibility on predictable policy coming out of China over the last couple of years has been really difficult. I mentioned it a little bit earlier this morning. I'll reword some of the things I said. If you're making an investment today in China, can you be sure the rules will be the same tomorrow? And that's the difficulty that some of those leaders of businesses, corporate America, have got right now with investing in that country. Which is the reason why you saw foreign direct investment, or at least part of it, actually fell negative in the most recent data in China for the first time going back in data to 1998. What Michael Hurston just said there, though, is fascinating about why China is so uh, determined to uh, maintain a relationship with both Apple and Tesla. Not because they need them more and the jobs, but because they set the tone for global corporations as yeah. a way that yeah. global companies can do business in China, which raises this question, okay, in this dance, what does that mean? What does it evolve to? And how much can it serve as a right. template for other companies that are forming their businesses in very different <clears throat> ways without that manufacturing the, They're the heart of the goods, the unit manufacture psychology of China, which has been there for decades. What do we do in finance? I mean, you mentioned Lawrence Fick was there. What does BlackRock do with China? What does Blackstone what does JP do? JP Morgan do? What does Blackstone do? Yeah. Ray Dalio, Bridgewater was also around a table. As well, too. Yeah, he probably gave you a, a, a copy of his book, Principles. Yeah. Is that right? Is that what he does? Yeah, Distributes probably. books everywhere he goes. Yeah, Even to dinners like that. that. Can we do another surveillance correction? Please Are you do. going to Las Vegas? I know you were looking at pit tickets. It's upon us. We're going to be talking about prices in the next hour. <clears throat> to attend okay. and to stay in Las Vegas this weekend. And those prices have been absolutely down, slashed. Down, down. Ooh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Surveillance cheaper. correction. Much That's cheaper. what we're doing this hour. Surveillance correction. Warmer in Las Vegas for John Farrow uh, this weekend. 47 degrees, not the gloom of 41 degrees. 8 degrees Celsius. We convert that. We convert that. For... Maybe those tires will actually get up to temperature and we can have a decent yeah. race this weekend. Yeah, we we'll see. Coming up next, Wei Lee of BlackRock on this market after a stellar week of gains we've seen over the last couple of days. Really all about Tuesday. Just a monster day of gains off the back of a small downside surprise on CPI. Equity futures this morning, just about unchanged from New York. Good morning.
consumers are still spending. And on top of that, you're getting some relief on the pricing side. If they continue to spend and add to their debt levels, that could slow things down. The trajectory over the longer run is that inflation should start to gradually decline over the coming months. That resilience, growth, story can run. I don't think a recessionary threat is immediate. I think we will slow, but I don't think this is an economy that's at any imminent threat of anything really bad happening. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. Lots of retailers reporting earnings this morning, live from New York City. Good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio, alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P 500, totally unchanged. This morning is all about the retailers, TK. Walmart is about to drop any second now. Just hearing from Macy's, even good news coming out of Macy's, Tom, entering the holiday period in a healthy inventory position. For we'll those, take that. Yeah, we'll for, take that. We'll take that. That's exactly right. For day trading Macy's, it's good. I'm looking at 70 to 5, and now it's back up to 12 with a nice lift today uh, to 13. There's two, two different types, as you mentioned earlier, John, two different types of retail as there is in every other sector. People nailing it. Maybe we'll see that from Walmart and people really challenged like Macy's. Walmart just dropping, Tom. I'll go for the numbers for the third quarter. Lisa can give you the outlook. For revenue for the third quarter, it is a tiny, you would say teens winks, BTK on revenue. Same thing on EPS. Bramo, the outlook far more important. What do you see? It's just slightly better. Again, all these slight beats in Walmart, uh, which is baby why you're seeing the shares not pop. Full year adjusted earnings per share expected to be $6.40 to $6.48. They'd previously seen $6.36 to $6.46. Basically, this is not much of a difference. So for people looking for a massive outperform signal, not necessarily getting Getting it, but this stock has been up so much more than all the other retail stocks so far this year. Well, I think you nailed it. It's relative to what you were looking for going into the numbers. If you were looking for an aggressive slowdown in the U.S. consumer going into 4Q in the holiday season, Lisa, looking at Target, looking at Walmart this morning, and I need to go through some of the details with a little bit more of a closer look. But ultimately. You don't see it, do you? You don't see this drastic slowdown people worried about. You raise a great point, which is that basically how much were people actually looking for a slowdown? How much are people actually pessimistic on the U.S. economy versus banking on this soft landing and continued acceleration? And that's why you're seeing some of these slight beats actually punished in the market for a name that already has a lot of expectation built into it. I I fault them. They they report pre-currency adjustment and they got a 5.2% revenue pop. Okay, mid-single digit. But in constant currency, they slice that right away to 4.3%. So, you know, the market will have to see how that is. The answer is you got a single digit revenue growth with dominance with market leverage and it's trading at a 30 multiple. I'll let you explain that to me, John. I, I just... Flat out, don't get it. Stock is down a little more than 2% in the pre-market. That's Walmart. Macy's is higher by about 4.5% following a massive day of gains yesterday for Target. More on the retailers in just a moment. Let's turn to the broader price action on the S&P 500. Equity futures shaping up as follows. We're just about unchanged on the S&P, not doing much at all. Yields are coming in four basis points. But let's face it, the bond market's been all over the place over the previous three days. On Tuesday, we had a 20 basis point move lower. Yesterday, almost 10 basis points higher. And this morning, Lisa, we're down another four or five basis points to let's call it 450. So maybe we don't have such a clear narrative after all, and we'll be sort of juggling around with others for the rest of the year. What we're watching is we did get the retailers that we just were talking about, Walmart and Macy's. Uh, we are going to be getting after the bell, raw stores and the gap. How much do we see uh, this sort of reaction in markets that if you don't see some sort of massive outperform uh, or jumping over a low hurdle, how much do you see that punished? And I actually think that's interesting uh, to signal where sentiment is. 8.30 a.m. we get U.S. initial jobless claims. Key indicator of whether the softness continues, especially given that it has been very slight and yet notable. The trend matters. We will be checking that out. And today, Fed speakers will come out and say that they're not going to declare victory. They're also going to say it's too early to tell anything, and they're lined up to give us that insight. Uh, Fed Vice Chair for Supervision Michael Barr, Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester, New York Fed President John Williams, Fed Governor Chris Waller, and Fed Governor Lisa Cook at a time of great uncertainty, and they cannot add much clarity because they do not have a crystal ball. And if they do declare Claire Victory, what happens? Exactly. Markets absolutely <laughs> rip. And then we sit here and say, why did they do that? Exactly. The market's working against what they want to achieve. And then we'll sit here and complain. So they're trying to say nothing. But truly, if you want to say nothing, don't say anything at all, which would be my advice. Don't schedule the speech. There don't are. Talk. Okay. If you have something to say, talk. 
there sometimes are interesting insights. If you don't, you know, is it just becoming noise? I don't know. I can't really argue against over communication because we get to talk about it every day and I get to put mm. it in my look ahead for the day and I sure, enjoy talking about it. Sure, you need something to say, right? Exactly. Okay. Walmart, comp sales, U.S. up 5%, e-commerce up 24%. That's a wow statistic. There was a sharper fall off in sales during the last two weeks of October. Yeah. That's the line coming from the yeah. Walmart CFO. Mm. I think that's an important line. What's in store for 4Q? Let's talk to Wei Li, Global Chief Investment Strategist over at BlackRock. Wei, good morning. Good morning. Happy to be here. Disinflation, tons of it. Is the economic slowdown next? Um, well, what we have seen so far this year is really the unwind of pandemic mismatch. So that has brought inflation down, but also growth is coming out of the hole that has been created by um, the pandemic, right? So uh, really normalization uh, in a way it is kind of unwinding pandemic mismatches. So is growth going to slow down? Yes, I think so, because we have had the fastest rate hike cycle since the 80s and it's going to act on growth with a bit of a with a bit of a lag, but uh, we're likely going to see kind of rolling growth slow down in different parts of the economy that is going to on aggregate feel not too bad, right? So we're looking at 0.5% growth for 2024. Um, so that's not too good, but we're not talking about deep recession um, and consumers have been strong. They find uh, 1 trillion additional dollar on their balance sheet that, that has been propping up sentiment. So really a environment that actually, as we compare that versus beginning of the year, a, a case can be made about putting some of the cash to work that has been sitting on the sideline. Well, we could talk about where to put that cash to work. This is coming from the CFO over at Walmart. We are more cautious on the consumer than we were 90 days ago at this time. More cautious on the consumer than we were 90 days ago. That's a change. Whereas you're thinking about putting money to work, mm -hmm. is it towards consumer discretionary? What is it towards? Well, it depends on what's been priced in by market. So, so far, if you look at U.S. equity market, 17% up for S&P 500, but the mega tech names still account for close to 90 percent of that performance. Equal weight at S&P is still um, flat on the year. And if you look at multiples, actually 72% of the U.S. equity market are trading at multiples lower um, versus the uh, pre-pandemic level. So there's a huge amount of dispersion. And I think dispersion is how we would think about putting cash to work rather than indiscriminately buying into the broader market just because uh, the, the growth and the inflation story uh, versus beginning of the year. This basically is giving voice to uh, the fact that Macy's is rallying today and Walmart is selling off. I mean, mm -hmm. isn't that basically an articulation of everything you said? Even if the consumer slows down, Macy's has priced it in. Walmart hasn't. Dispersion among sectors and also <coughs> dispersion within sectors. We're focusing on companies that are able to grow their revenue. They're able to keep up their margin, even in this uh, growth slowdown type of environment. So the time for being selective and, and, and alpha focused is really here. There's a bigger question here, mm -hmm. which is where is the balance of risks in terms of market participants' eyes? Is it that the economy reaccelerates and that the <coughs> Fed has to do more? Or is it the opposite, that we get a significant slowdown that people are still cautious around? It feels like it might be that people are more concerned about an over-acceleration at this point rather than the recession that people are exhausted of even thinking about still. I think at this very juncture, on this very day, maybe that is true, but it's incredible how quickly narratives have been shifting. I mean, we're talking about 10 year moving 20 basis point in response to a monthly data print, right? Like it's incredible how long-term kind of uh, uh, measures are reacting so sensitively to short-term data print. So I would say, yes, right now at this juncture, maybe, but uh, you know, give it a day or two that uh, risks can shift very quickly um, as we look ahead to uh, next year, I think it's really uh, focused and boiling down to what's in the price and not be carried away with the daily noise of, you know, what's the narrative of the day, what's the narrative mm -hmm. of the hour. Your claim in mathematics in your China and then to Cambridge and now leading the working group on China at BlackRock, your thoughts on what we've observed in the last 24 hours and particularly your thoughts on the embedded bipartisan distrust that America has for Chinese leadership? Well, uh, what we have seen the last 24 hours maybe is putting 
a tentative floor and re-establishing communication channels. And I think that actually has been um, much, uh, much needed. They are speaking for the first time in, um, in a year. Um, I would also say that we're talking about just kind of putting a floor and just a uh, tactical uh, pause in terms of the geopolitical uh, uh, geopolitical focus because you know if you think about the mm-hmm. upside um, so far what's come out is kind of establishing mm-hmm. conversations around AI risk fentanyl and right. broader communication channel but what really <coughs> matters for, 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 for the economy is tech what really matters for uh, the economy is broader kind of uh, engagement and right. we have yet to this see this nation that. is riveted from a balloon from Montana off the Carolinas issue. I don't want you to speak for Mr. Fink, that's inappropriate, a leader of BlackRock, but what are your thoughts on the meeting of Commercial America with President Xi for dinner last night? I think um, Commercial America are involved in the conversation, a part of the conversation, in order to stay informed on issues that um, they can then really represent and 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 conduct on behalf of their uh, clients. Uh, in the same way that we're doing that on behalf of our uh, mm-hmm. clients as well, we need to be staying on top of uh, the issues so as to act in the best interest of what we um, what we represent. Mm-hmm. Um, and the broader picture coming out of China is growth is starting to stabilize in response to incremental easing, but uh, sentiment is still really negative. You talk about yeah. China, you speak to investors, you speak to strategists, sentiments are still quite negative. Market dynamics is still quite negative, and it takes a lot for consumers to, to, to kind of really embrace the reopening in the Chinese economy the way that we have seen in the US. It's been a big disappointment this year, the underperformance mm. of China's economy relative to the outperformance of the US economy. We were coming into 2023 talking about US recession and a monster reopening of China, and it's just been the other way around. Wei, thank you. It's good to see you. It always <coughs> is. Wei Li of BlackRock. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. Equity markets pulling back just a touch on the S&P 500. We're negative here by 0.17%. That's the equity story. Let's get to Walmart. Walmart in the pre-market looks like this. I want to pick out one single name. We're down by more than 4% to 162.75. The numbers, not terrible modestly raising the annual profit forecast, but the tone on the outlook, just the commentary around it from the CFO, in an interview saying the following, on a sharper fall off in sales in the last two weeks of October, saying this, TK, we are more cautious on the consumer than we were 90 days ago. More cautious on the consumer than we were 90 days ago. (coughs) This is the fear right now in equities, and I know we've had a big move this week, we've been talking about the happy talk of the last couple of days. You've had the disinflation, is the slowdown next. I think that's the ultimate fear right. still, Tom. And the other one I'd throw in there as well, and we've repeated this line through the year so far, is the economist who cried recession. They've said it so many times through 2023 that I think a lot of people well, are beginning to ignore it. So it's surprising when you start to hear it from corporate America. We forget that retail's quoted typically in nominal terms, and you've got to believe nominal GDP is going to come in. You have disinflation, if you believe in that, or even a resilient 3% inflation. And then what does the real economy do? And if you get both of those, John, coming down in different ways, but coming down, you get a dampened nominal GDP, and that goes right to Walmart's revenue line. where they And these are small moves, but they're huge. For them to go from 5% to 4% modeling of revenue growth is game-changing. I want to go through all of the line items. I want to understand where the gains came and where the, where the losses really came into play here. If the gains came from shoppers looking for groceries that are lower priced ahead of the holidays, is that a good signal for the U.S. economy or is that a negative uh, signal yeah. for the U.S. economy? I often ask the same question. <clears throat> the stock is down by about 4%. Equity futures are doing okay. We're pulling back a touch. We're down by about 0.2% there. Coming up shortly, Michael O'Rourke, <clears throat> Chief Market Strategist at Jones Trading. We'll catch up with him in the next hour from New York City. This is Bloomberg. While the Fed's been tightening a lot, the underlying health of the private sector, both households and businesses, remain quite strong. So I think we will slow, uh, but I don't think this is an economy that's at any imminent threat of anything really bad happening. I think the Fed is going to be patient here, but I don't think this is a 
a victory. And I don't think we're going to be giving uh, the Fed room to ease off the inflation numbers anytime soon. We've heard that so many times this week. That was Bruce Kasman at JP Morgan heading up the global economic research team that ultimately this market is itching to declare victory in the fight against inflation. Fed officials do not want to go there at all. We saw that from Mary Daly of the San Francisco Fed. Speaking to Colby Smith in the Financial Times yesterday, she almost said it, Tom, we don't want to declare victory. On the economic slowdown that may develop in the coming quarters, let's look at two retailers, one Macy's, two Walmart. And the difference between these two right now is one company saying all the right things and the other one saying all the wrong things. Macy's beating on profits, inventory, that story's better, that stock is up by close to 12%. Walmart's down 4%. The numbers weren't terrible. The outlook wasn't too bad. They inched up the outlook just a touch. But the commentary from the CFO, I have to say, kind of dreadful. Talking about a sharper fall off in sales during the last two weeks of October. And I keep going back to this line, Lisa, more cautious on the consumer than we were 90 days ago. That's exactly what stuck out to me, this idea of a quickly deteriorating picture at a time when everyone is wondering, is there going to be another shoe to drop? And I think that's the key, right? Are we getting that slowdown in real time in a new way? And they're referring to that. And as we hear from those companies, stocks are pulling back on the S&P 500. We're down about 0.2%. The cross-asset picture looks a little something like this. Yields are pulling back by about three basis points. Let's call it 450 on a 10-year, and hopefully we can get some stability in today's session. We have this warning, though, from the former New York Fed President Bill Dudley, saying U.S. authorities need to act before the safe haven of the Treasury market becomes a source of instability. Here's the quote. Ideally, the government would do its part by getting its fiscal policy in order. Unfortunately, Congress appears unlikely to do so anytime soon unless the bond market vigilantes return in enough force to compel a constructive response. Mike McKee joins us around the table, economics and policy correspondent. Mike, you've heard that warning from New York Fed President, former New York Fed President Bill Dudley. What do you make of it? Uh, well, he's absolutely right. It doesn't look like Congress is going to do anything. There's a really interesting piece out by Karen Dynan, who was the former Treasury Department chief economist now at Harvard. It shows the expected path of debt, uh, the chart she has. I, I didn't bring it since we're on radio here, but basically we're at a point where we were last in the 1940s after World War II. And from here, it's almost a hockey stick up. And so obviously there are problems in the future. What Bill Dudley is talking about is somebody's got to buy all the debt we're going to sell. And because of various regulations, it's hard for primary dealers to absorb that amount of debt onto their balance sheets. So he has a couple of different ideas on how you could make the system work to make it safer, uh, including uh, giving the primary dealers some ways around the restrictions on what they can hold, have them be agents, right. and then make the Fed's repo system all worthwhile, uh, a work for everybody, uh, rather than just the primary dealers and uh, well, agents. Let's frame that out with someone that has the experience on this. At the New York Federal Reserve, William Dudley joins us now, former New York Fed president, Bloomberg Opinion columnist. Bill, you and I'm going to suggest uh, Professor Williams, now holding court in the former Dudley chair, have a unique perspective on our flows, our liquidity, our trust. Sitting at the New York Fed, what is the confidence or trust deterioration you've observed? Uh, I think there is complete trust uh, in the New York Fed uh, because that, the Fed basically understands the plumbing of the financial system and understands what needs to be done to make sure that plumbing works uh, all, always, even under times of stress. One area of vulnerability where the Fed and the Treasury are looking at right now is the Treasury market itself because the volume of Treasury borrowing has gone up dramatically, and the capacity of the primary dealers to take on that uh, that burden uh, has diminished because of all the regulation on capital and you know leverage. So there there do there do need to be some significant changes, I think, to the Treasury market to make it more uh, strong and resilient. And what I propose is a couple of things: one, central clearing of Treasuries, so they all go through a central counterparty. So your risk is just to the central counterparty allows you to net down a lot of bilateral risk to a single risk to one uh, end person. Second, uh, uh, increase the, the leverage, uh, the haircuts uh, a bit so, they, so that they don't need to be increased during times of stress. Right now you have low haircuts and then there's, a, there's stress and the haircuts go up, which force people to sell. And the last thing, uh, which Mike, Mike was talking about, is uh, 
opening up the Fed's uh, repo facility more broadly, uh, making it so that people can take treasuries and turn them into cash at any time. And if they know that, then they don't actually have to sell the treasuries uh, be, uh, you know, in anticipation of a problem. Uh, they can wait to see if they actually need the cash. Bill, if none of that, none of that gets done, do you think the action we've seen and what you expect compromises the QT program coming out of the Fed? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think the QT program basically is on autopilot as long as there isn't a lot of market disruption. So if the market performs reasonably well, then QT keeps going. Only if we have the kind of events like we had in September 2019 or March 2020, we see QT suspended. Because if the market isn't working right, the last thing the Fed wants to do is dump more securities into the marketplace. What's at stake here, uh, Bill, if there isn't this sort of fix that you propose or this three-pronged uh, proposal, how much are we seeing what sort of the new normal looks like with bouncing around 20 basis points on a 10-year yield from day to day versus something more significant that creates a real crisis in the world's deepest and most liquid market? I think the volatility we've seen this year is not a, a treasury market function problem. I think the volatility we've seen this year is people trying to figure out what's, what's the trajectory of short-term rates uh, over the next uh, six to 12 months. And there's been lots of changes in view as, as the economic data has come out. Uh, I think the problem is more when all of a sudden people want to dump treasuries and there's not enough capacity on the other side to absorb that. Uh, that ha has happened a few times. Uh, and it, obviously it needs, you know, it needs a catalyst. And it's hard to predict what that catalyst could be. But what I want is a treasury market that can handle those kind of shocks if and when they occur. Are you saying that right now there is an inability? What do you expect will happen if there is some sort of catalyst? Well, if there is a, some sort of catalyst, one of the problems is we, a lot of the treasury trading is handled by uh, algorithmic traders who basically pro pro don't really provide long-term <coughs> liquidity to the market. They just provide liquidity for a microsecond, and then the, 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 they, 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 they move that security off to someone, someone else. And when things get uh, scary, uh, they completely withdraw from the market. And then the market is really now then has to go to the primary dealer community. But the primary dealer community hasn't allocated capital to this business because most of the time they're actually not doing it. So there's no one there at sort of at the, at, 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 in, in extremis provide balance sheet capacity to sort of calm the market. And that's one reason why you'd like to have the ability to take your treasury securities to the Fed and turn them into cash without having, actually having to sell them. Uh, so the Treasury is the only one, uh, the Fed is the only one who has a balance sheet that is actually elastic. So why not make it clear that that ba elastic right. balance sheet is available on an ex-ante basis, as opposed to only ex-post after Levi actually had the problem? Bill, how does our data dependency look next year? I think we've had a celebration of disinflation in place. Is the nature or character of the Fed's data dependency different now and forward? Well, I think they're more confident that they've, uh, you know, mo moved monetary policy to a restrictive level, and it's actually working to bring down inflation. Uh, but we still don't know a lot of things. We don't really know if uh, how tight monetary policy is. We don't know how long it's going to take to get inflation down to two percent. So I think the degree of uncertainty and risk is a lot less less today than it was, say, 18 months ago uh, when the Fed started the tightening process. But there's still a lot of uncertainty about how strong the economy can be and whether the Fed is done. What a roller coaster ride this bond market's been on over the last few months. Bill, wonderful to catch up with you, sir. Always is. Former New York Fed president, Bill Dudley there. An interesting, thought-provoking piece from Bill on the future of this Treasury market. Let's just return to one single name in the pre-market. It is Walmart. Session lows. It is down and down hard by close to 6% now, Lisa. Cautious outlook on the U.S. consumer going into year end. And as you noted, more cautious over the past 90 days, which highlights the immediacy of some of this downturn. It should be noted that Walmart shares were near record highs coming from this. So how much is this evaluation question? But the larger macro question that I think we're getting some hints of in these earnings is the consumers are not recklessly spending in any way, shape, or form. It is a new form of spending. Stock is down more than 6%. Coming up shortly, George Concarvas of MUFG to weigh in on this bond market, some of the recent economic data. And we might get a comment as well on some of the moves we're seeing from the retailers in America. That's still to come from New York City. Good morning.
your equity market pulling back right now on the S&P 500 down by 0.2%. Walmart session lows down about 6%. The numbers from them, the numbers from them weren't bad. But the commentary about maybe a deceleration in sales going into year end, I think has caught everyone's eye. Sam Rowe out on Twitter, just one of my favorites. This is great. Reason. Walmart's Q3 was strong, which is bad because it must mean consumers are trading down. But Walmart's sales fell off in October, which is bad because the consumer must be doing really bad. But Walmart <laughs> sales picked up in November. No way that's good. That's the latest from <laughs> Sam Rowe this morning, Tom. Yeah. If you're following, it's like, it doesn't matter yeah. what the numbers are at Walmart. It's bad. Stock is down. <laughs> major, major pet peeve, John, I have. And you know, I talk about the big banks and we don't understand their dominance dominance is in retail, we conflate the Macy's Day Parade as being as dominant as what's going on in Bentonville. The market cap of three retail names that I conflate into one, I'm as wrong, wrong, wrong in this as anyone. Walmart, half a trillion dollars. Target, under a hundred uh, billion dollars. Macy's is minuscule. Yeah, barely exists, right? On market cap. I know. Nobody talks about this except Bloomberg surveillance. Thank you, Tom. And Tom I, t I think and it's Tom terrible. Keen. We conflate all these names together, and the pros like George Kigalis well, don't, don't do I don't think we do. This. I mean, to be fair, I don't think we do. I don't think anyone compares I, Macy's to Walmart. But in the same breath, we're like the Thanksgiving parade, and Bramo goes and to where they blow up the balloons. You're the only one that's talked about a parade. I remember we went to the parade once Remember together. how they ruined the balloons? You could go right up to the balloons and literally touch them, take your four-year-old Touch the balloons. Touch the balloons? Yeah. You could actually when they like, walk up, onto the road. Right oh, when, when they're blowing them up. Blowing them up the night before. You have okay. a beverage yeah, in your hand. Okay, but that's it's different. so crowded that it's very hard to do that. You like, have to, okay. yeah. You know, you know, I remember we did the parade together. That was fun. We did. Talk. Yeah, yeah, that was good. That's so yeah, sweet. Yeah, yeah. Back when we were in speaking terms. Wait, when we used to spend <clears throat> Thanksgiving together. Yeah, you know, You now? came to one of those parades. Yes, yeah, it was good. lovely. We didn't do the parade together, though. It was a beautiful thing. It was a beautiful When we all liked each other. We went for breakfast the other day. We went for breakfast the other day, and this table of women came up to us and said, hello, you know, so nice to meet you, blah, blah, blah. Bad taste. Anyway, and they carried on talking, and they said this, we're so pleased to see you together. <laughs> because they were convinced you actually despise each because other. Because we thought you hated each other. Yeah, anyway, it's great. We did we separate are. selfies, so, you know, we kept going. <laughs> Under surveillance this morning, <laughs> President Joe Biden defending Israel's decision to send forces into Shifa Hospital. Biden saying Hamas's use of the facility against international norms constituted a, quote, war crime. The UN and Middle Eastern countries, including Jordan and Turkey, condemning the raid. Israel, Lisa, saying its soldiers found weapons and other military equipment, showing the hospital was used as a base by Hamas. Okay, there's a lot here to unpack. First of all, the U.S. is backing what Israel is saying, uh, that it, this is used as a military base. And there was some acknowledgement of Hamas using hospitals as military bases back in the day. Uh, there is a question and a lot of allegations of war crimes uh, for using the hospital as, as a human shield and also for going into a hospital. The big takeaway for me, just sort of zooming out away from a very emotional conversation, is the pressure is building. And there is only so many more weeks that this can go on before it becomes completely untenable to continue without some sort of resolution, which is why I am watching some of the discussions around uh, some agreement to give back some of the hostages and some sort of resolution on that standpoint. So what we achieved in Washington yesterday, away from all of this, we've managed to avoid a government shutdown. What that didn't include was aid for Ukraine or for Israel. So the fight that's about to take place in the new year down in Washington, Lisa, given everything you've just said, over spending cuts after some of the warnings we've had from credit rating companies, over providing aid to Ukraine, Republicans increasingly against some of that, and providing aid to Israel, where you see, I would say, a fringe of the Democratic Party getting bigger, opposing that effort as well. This is going to be really messy in the new year. Especially because time is running out, right? And that's sort of another question. There are some question marks about where the funding is coming from. The Pentagon has delivered a number of weapons to Israel <clears throat> without having some sort of increase in the funding requirements. But you're right. This is going to get increasingly messy, increasingly political, which is just, again, amps up the pressure to come to some sort of resolution, if not resolution, some better space in the next couple of weeks. In California yesterday, it was just sunshine and rainbows, a beautiful thing. China and the United States playing happy families. President Xi Jinping speaking to some of the top U.S. executives. BlackRock's Larry Fink, Apple's Tim Kirk, Blackstone's Stephen Schwartzman, Bridgewater founder Ray Dalio. Some of the names granted a place near Xi. China's leader telling the audience of business leaders in America, China does not seek sphere of influence and will not fight a cold war, Lisa, or a hot war with anyone. 
this was changing the mood music. We definitely felt that there was some kind of progress, just that they were talking. How far this goes, especially during an election year, again, remains to be seen because there's no candidate for president. I mean, it just goes to the divide between some of the happy talk and the populace right, speaking in the happy United talk, States. The yeah. pandas are coming back <laughs> to U.S. zoos. I'm speaking excited. Speaking happy talk. I like that. This is important. so cute. The, Honestly. The, the pandas Honestly. are coming back. <laughs> Honestly. Your the eyes. pandas are up. coming back. The airlines are coming back. And all that is tangential and removed from what we're talking about. And Robert Kaplan, in my book of the year, The Loom of Time, John, it's on the greater Mediterranean. It's not on China at this time, but it's all the same. The U.S. has a human rights-led politics. Is anyone listening? Is China listening? Are our commercial titans oh. listening to a human rights dialogue out of Washington? There's so many of these meetings, Tom, are for public consumption. I was looking at the table yesterday on the U.S. side. John Kerry was sitting there. The climates are for this administration sure. and clearly they want to put pressure on china to do something about pollution and this is something china i imagine wants to work with them on but lisa ultimately what happens let's be you know really realistic about this china continues to pollute and then sounds the words well, sold solar panels that's how this plays out i always get the feeling that if kerry turns up they're almost sort of <laughs> laughing to themselves because they know how this works bramo you get to say this is an area we can work on this is something we can do something about meanwhile what happens what happens domestically? We know what happens. And then what happens? They produce the solar panels and they sell them to the world. Who wins? <laughs> Who wins? It's a great question, and it's the reason why I think there's a lot of skepticism around this, the reason why the mood music's going to change a lot come next year. There we go. Grandma wants to wrap up that convo. Let's finish on this. TK, <laughs> this is just for you. Finally. You're calling Formula me out. One. I know. I could sense it in your voice. Las Vegas <clears throat> this weekend. Ticket prices for F1. Hotel room rates tumbling. <laughs> the cheapest tickets for Thursday night selling for $119, Friday, $259. This according to reseller TickPick. Both less than half what they were a month ago. Liberty Media, the owner of F1, starting to lower profit expectations for the race. Tom, we've made a massive effort to cover Formula One this year, but we've talked repeatedly to guests that have come on this program. Is F1 chasing commercial gain at the sacrifice of the sport? and sport and integrity. And I've talked I, about going to places like Vegas, Miami. We'll see what the track is like this weekend, Tom. I'm not a big fan of doing these things. And it looks like at the moment, I'm not gonna say it's falling flat on its face, right. but it's certainly not turning out to be the big thing people thought it would well, be a I think few we've months done ago. Great coverage on this led by John Farrow, I should point out. And John, I'm not gonna talk car talk here. I can fail at that, but I'm gonna equate it directly to Target's uh, price chart in that you've got a pandemic bulge here that was a Netflix special. Everyone has rechanged their strategic vision off of a Netflix special, and at some point that special ebbs away to where the next Formula One is. Is it three races in the United States in a given, what, 23, 24 race season? I don't see it. You know, I, I just don't get it. You got Austin, is Miami the other one? Help me. Yeah. My, I, thought, yeah. I thought Miami and Austin were really boring. I thought Brazil was great because I'm an amateur. Brazil had hills. They were going oh, up and down. Okay. They were going, no, come on. They were going up and down versus going around. What's, what's Las Vegas going to look like? It doesn't I even, don't know. It doesn't even know. look safe yet. Are they going to put up all the pads and all that? They're desperate to break America. Absolutely desperate to do it. Well, it's funny. Mike McKee sent me this article yesterday and he said, look, no one watches Formula One. And he talked about ticket prices going down and the viewing going down. And then I went on the Bloomberg terminal last night, one of the most read stories. So it's like people like to follow the spectacle, Tom. They like to follow the spectacle. And right. this is still a spectacle this weekend. Should we see if George Concalvus wants yeah, to weigh in do. on He's Formula One? Let's do that. On rates, George Concalvus, too quickly here, head of U.S. macro strategy, MUFG, this morning. What a week it's been, George. What a November already, halfway through Q4. Remodel, readjust to get to the end of the year. Uh, and by the way, John, Tom, Lisa, I mean, for those that know me, I have a pretty decent car game as well. So if you guys want to go into cars, we can do that as well. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I'm decent on rates as well, I think. Um, look, it's been a, you know, and we've been trying to figure out, you know, is the Fed really done? I think that the market's now dri uh, drawn that conclusion post CPI. But, you know, when you're on a hold, that's, you know, equally as challenging. I mean, typically in the past, balls come down and we've seen rate balls come off. We've seen the market you know, collapse in rates from the, the 5%, which we, we traded there for like five minutes. Um, so like, it's really not fair to say that we really touched 5% if we only had a few uh, transactions go through. So I think you know, we're trying to establish a range here. 
Is Walmart a good macro signal for you, George? I think the retailers and just overall consumer spending is is obviously an important macro signal. Uh, we we um, we think linear, but the world operates in nonlinear fashion, and I think we're noticing that you know, the consumer overextended itself, uh, went through a lot of savings, got into credit, and now they're realizing that you know, they're going to have to pay it back. You said that the world operates in a nonlinear fashion, which really was the reason why that one line screamed out to John and myself uh, about the last 90 days, Walmart saw a real drop off in consumer spending. Is that significant to you as much as it is, not just for a stock specific type of story, but something more? I think it's speaking to this idea that you know, we've entered into the end of the year. It's been a, an intense year. Uh, a lot of spending, uh, it's uncertainty around where the consumer really is. And now with you know, post-student repayments, bigger debt burdens, high interest costs are finally sinking in. I think this is, we've been impatient with the long and variable lags, but they're, they're coming and they're here. And I think that it's all just emblematic of that. George, model out the 10-year yield. I mean, I, I understand you've got a broader remit now at MUFG, but let's go back to the George, old George Congalvis. Where's the 10-year yield in a year? Uh, it's probably sub four percent. I mean, if we like literally one year from today, yeah, probably sub four percent. Okay, I mean, I mean, it's sub four percent, John. To me, is game changing. I mean, that that really, what does that do to the thirty-year mortgage rate? I just got a I mean, message from someone regarding our conversation about Formula One and said, <clears throat> could it be a leading indicator of consumers beginning to push back? We started to see that. We saw that in Burberry uh, a little bit earlier. It's too difficult, George, to draw these conclusions. I think to to Lisa's question whether Walmart is a decent macro signal, you look at Burberry bad numbers today, but I can give you lots of reasons as to why Burberry specifically is having problems. Formula One this weekend in Las Vegas and pushback against high ticket prices. But again, I can say the same thing about Formula One in America, given the dominant season we've had by one team, one driver. Season's over. George, what do you look for, for that kind of leading indicator of a slowdown? Look, I mean, there's, there's a lot of these things could be idiosyncratic, and I agree we shouldn't, like, you know, over embellish and, and, and extrapolate too much, because that's what gets us into trouble to begin with. Uh, but I do look at you know, the second tier data of the large components of growth, inflation, uh, labor market, uh, and a lot of them have been signaling in the PMIs and all the sort of signals. You know, the, the sentiment signals have been suggesting that we're in some sort of slowdown, definitely manufacturing led. Uh, but you know, the, the underlying of the labor market has been getting softer. Inflation, we clearly now see, is, is falling off pretty quickly. Uh, and that really kind of poses an issue considering that a lot of it has been energy. Core probably will kind of bounce around a little bit until we actually get really a breakthrough and make a run towards 2%. But, you know, this kind of, we're all kind of splitting hairs in many ways because it's really the end game. If we know that we're eventually going to get closer to 2% by sometime in 2024, why would the Fed keep rates of 5.5%? I mean, they're ensuring a recession at that point. George, got to leave it there. It's good to catch up. George and Carvis there of MUFG. If you're just joining the program, equity futures down here by about 0.2%. Jobless claims coming up a little bit later. Bramo, this is the one for me. If you can make excuses for the likes of Burberry, you can make excuses for Formula One, there are tons. If claims start breaking out, you can't make excuses for that, can you? The problem with this, though, is that I've heard from a lot of economists on Wall Street regarding the labour market who think that this could be a downturn, yes, but ultimately one where people hoard labour, given the difficulty that they had hiring in the pandemic, Lisa, and coming out of the pandemic. That's exactly what I was going to say, is that not only is this a lagging indicator, it might be a faulty indicator this time around because people are going to be very reluctant to lay people off, which raises this question, could you see the downturn without that signal signaling anything uh, that leads it, but instead is a very much late to the game type of metric? We'll talk about the retailers. We've heard from Walmart. We've heard from Macy's. We heard from Target yesterday. Coming up next, Chuck Grum of Gordon Haskett on the outlook for retailers in America. From New York City this morning, good morning to you all. Equity futures just slightly negative. This is Bloomberg. You're seeing a consumer that is certainly exploring many different channels of spending, including online, and that creates a lot more opportunities for them to get products. And it also creates a lot more need for retailers to compete with these big moments in time where they offer promotions. And I think that's what's going to be indicative. So we'll learn a lot from the Black Friday period, and it's approaching very quickly. <laughs> Michelle Mather, the MasterCard Economics Institute Chief Economist for North America. 
on the consumer in America and retailers. We've got a retailer right now we need to talk about, the biggest in this country. Walmart is down 8% in the pre-market. Session lows, and it's not really about the numbers. The numbers are okay, the outlook wasn't bad. It's the commentary around the numbers that is the problem, about this sharp sell-off in the weeks of October lease from what could be in store going through the next few months into year end. Two thoughts. They understood this and yet they didn't in decrease their full year outlook. So this raises this question <coughs> of how much are people actually looking at the, at the numbers? How much are they actually looking at the economics of it? And how much are they looking at a valuation that was at record highs and the potential growth that was implicated there and saying actually they're probably not going to be able to achieve it. And that I think is a story that is much more nuanced and difficult to make it something macro uh, to carry through. Tom's on top of Macy's just for you TK. Stop is higher by more than 10 percent in the pre-market macy's up tom lena inventories going into the holiday season numbers were okay two very different stories right now tom in early trading i mean i'm looking john at walmart and what's driving their sales and part of it is this is a little table tree john for the entryway 24 inch non-lit sutter pink spruce artificial christmas tree by who's holiday that from? time who's that from macy's this is from this is from walmart from walmart this okay. is popping in i mean this is an attractive price at nine dollars 96 i was very impressed impressed with logistics coming out of home depot and you said gap was you, challenging home depot's great gaps very challenging yeah if you want frictionless exchanges with a retailer, <clears throat> I did not get that. Well, I like what Gap. McKee said. Where McKee lives, he's near some place where you can take back the Amazon, and they order it's tons of Whole stuff, Foods. and he just walks over and he hands it to them. And then they do that. Is it Lowe's as well? They do that there too. I don't is know. it one of those stores? Yeah. Yeah. Tied. Like that. I haven't it's, done it. It's a retail experience. We talked to a lot of experts on this, and this is what you get if you get a double degree at the acclaimed Holy Cross, the College of the Holy Cross in economics in accounting. The hyper detail mathematics ratios, the financial analysis of retail that Chuck Graham has acclaimed for. He's a Gordon Haskett. I'm not going to mince words. We protect the copyright of all of our guests. Get his brilliance from Gordon That's Haskett. Fun. How do you go and outperform on Walmart with a 30 PE? Explain why Walmart has a PE like a luxury goods pervader. I mean, Walmart's been executing flawlessly for, for several quarters, and even maybe the past couple of years. Um, and the business mix shift and the gross margin visibility. I mean, there's never been a time in the 20 years I've covered Walmart where I've been this bullish on, on, on the long-term outlook. Clearly today, it's an, it's interesting. It's it's a little bit about positioning. You guys talked in your, your remarks about valuation. That's a factor. Um, if you really dig underneath the covers here, it's really less about the top line and I think less about the, the back half of October commentary that the CFO recently made. I think it's more about the margin flow through. That was disappointing. The U.S. margins were disappointing. So when you have a stock at, at an all time high at very rich valuations and you get a little bit of a disconnect, you get this right. negative reaction. I think the stock will come back throughout the day and over the next couple of weeks. But today could be could be, could be difficult for the stock. Can they compete with Amazon or Dara? I never said this before, Chuck Grom, but can they beat Amazon? I don't know if they can beat Amazon, but they can definitely compete. And I, I think the physical assets of their 4,000 plus stores in the country really provide them with being really close to, and being able to connect with their customers. So Walmart Plus, we, there's a lot of opportunity there. So can they beat? Probably not, but can they compete 100%? Chuck, you said that margins disappointed, and that's really yeah. interesting at a time where people are wondering when are consumers going to start pushing back on price increases. Is this an indication that Walmart is seeing that that time is now, and that in order for them to compete, they've got to take a hit on the margins? Well, I think almost uniformly, you know, consumers are pushing back on price, and that's why prices are coming down <laughs> almost across the board. And we we cover Home Depot, we cover TJ, we cover um, you know Target, you know Macy's, Walmart. They're all talking about price, you know prices starting to flatten out and retreat. I think the U.S. margins were softer because of the GLP uh, influence on, on the on the on the margins because of the drug. It's a lower margin product. It was a was a higher sales in the here in the quarter. And when you have discretionary sales be softer, those are higher margin categories for Walmart. So it's really a mixed factor. It, it looks like obviously the calls at eight o'clock and the callbacks are later in the day. So we'll get more clarity later in the day. But but looking at what it looks like now, I think it's more of a mixed factor. You know, we were talking earlier about what's good news or bad news for the broader economy when Walmart does badly or well in terms of which consumers are shopping 
stopping there. Is there any read through based on the earnings that we've gotten from retailers about whether we're seeing a division between haves and have nots, about whether we are seeing any broader trends in terms of how the consumer is evolving, which areas are going to be bright spots and which won't? That's a great question. I think it's really too early to tell. I mean, you, you look at Walmart's numbers, they're up, you know, comp up five, Target yesterday down five. You know, um, you look at Macy's down, down six or seven here. Um, it, it looks pretty uniform. I think there's pressures across the board. It's not really like the high end doing well. You guys talked about Burberry earlier. We'll get more color from, from Nordstrom next week. Uh, I, I think it's pretty uniform across the board. And, you know, we've been talking about our consumer surveys being weak, traffic being weak. The, today's numbers and the reactions here over the past 48 hours have really nothing to do with the top line. The top line and the sales are pretty much in line with where people thought. It's A, right. positioning, and it's the margin flow throughs for certain companies. What's the future of Nordstrom's? The family dynamic and also the attempt to be luxury. I guess what I, as an amateur I'd say is accessible luxury. Is Nordstrom a sleeper for five years out? I think if I think it's a great concept. Um, I think the the rack has really been their Achilles heel over the past several years. So if they could get the rack fixed, I, I think the fact that they, they don't have a huge presence of full line stores across the country is actually a, a tremendous asset vis-a-vis -vis Kohl's or Macy's, which have got hundreds of stores. So I think it's a, I think it's a viable concept. They, they need to get the rack fixed. And that's what people and investors have been waiting for. Chuck, what's the rack? Uh, it's their off price division. And what do you mean by fixed? What's wrong with it? Uh, well, when you look at you know look at TJ and Ross comping up, you know low to mid single digits, and and you see the rack comping down, it's just it's been broken. I mean, just their business hasn't been good. It seems like there's been some cannibalization across the store base. We're not exactly sure. Um, there's been some merchandise issues. They've tried to price up when when the consumer wanted it to be priced down. Um, but yeah, the, the, the Nordstrom's viable for sure. Um, but the rack division, their off price division, I'm sorry for not clarifying earlier, is really the. No, it's OK. Now I know. I'm just just for people who are trying to follow. Have you noticed, yeah. Chuck, that the off rack, the rack, is actually close to the Nordstrom stores? Have you noticed yeah. that? Which is yeah. kind of odd. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you, my wife will, will, will tend to go to the rack now a lot more than the full line. So yeah. that's what I'm talking about the cannibalization factor. Um, of that is, is probably maybe the, the issue here. And maybe they need to close more rack stores. But, you know, ironically, they're trying to grow more right now. So we're hold rated. We're kind of we're, we're kind of perplexed on some of the strategies they are for the time being. It's trying to be TJX and Nordstrom at the same time. Which yeah. Are, with yeah, the same it's, 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 it's hard accurate. to do. Yeah. Chuck, thank you. Chuck Grom got of Golden Haskett. Right. Thank you, mate. The stock is down by about 7%. I was thinking of... Um, Coles, wasn't I? Yes. That's where you take your Amazon stuff back. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. don't think it's, but then, yeah, the, then right. there was a question of whether that actually was bringing any traffic. With Whole Foods, they actually are connected to, you know, same, same company. Thing. Yeah, same <laughs> so thing. So it's actually, sense. you know, just more. To Chuck's point on Nordstrom Rack, it doesn't yes. really make sense. I mean, I drive past one every morning. It's kind of odd. If you want to have the same branding as Nordstrom and you want to shop at Nordstrom, why not go to the Rack and get lower prices? Saks do the same thing, you know. Saks off Fifth? Yeah, Saks off Fifth. It's like, and it's just around the corner from Fifth. Right. It's, well, like, I'm looking at a I rack here. Yeah. The, John, this is I've, something you'd wear cash on the weekends. A Brooks Brothers sport fit corduroy shirt jacket. Sort of an off-white okay. kind of thing. Can I just say, this is the way the show's been going this morning. We mentioned a retailer. Tom goes to the website, no, picks out a product never been for either in a him Nord or one I, of us. Honest to God, I've never been in a Nordstrom there. rack or a Nordstrom. I've never been in a Nordstrom. No, okay. $148, John. It's selling at $27.97. How do you do that and build a brand? I've never been in a Brooks Brothers. It's 81% off. A Brooks Brothers, those suits that are like really broad. Long the, Island Made. I wore their tie tapered. last night. Are I they those a, suits? They, they those like business. boxy jackets that are like... They're, they're like Faco British. Yes. From Two way inches past this the suit, on either side. This suit... Like it says it's a 48, but it's like a 52. Well, that's all, yeah. you know. John, this brands. suit is based on a 1950s Brooks With Brothers box suit. With those thick Don't even listen to me, you know. Like that. Like that. Yeah. Is that what they are? No, I mean, they, Brothers, right? they had different sizes and shapes. I love that you're okay. coming to me for suit guidance, which I actually know Just, more about because I have been to a Brooks Brothers than other people. Okay. Do they do tailoring there? They do. Okay. So, like, the suits fit. Yeah, but I think that they went right. bankrupt. Do you shop at Brooks Brothers? Used to for years. Moves the buttons. That's what the tailor said when I was eight years old. What did they say? Moves the buttons. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Move, they yell out, moves the buttons. Why? I'll tell you about this suit. This right, is based we'll off a 1950s Brooks Brothers suit. Yeah, no, I can tell. Let's talk yeah, about it next. <laughs>
How quickly does the Fed cut or do they cut? If they cut, then I think we're off to the races. I think the Fed is going to be patient here, but I don't think this is a victory. The Fed definitely wants to continue QT for as long as they possibly can. The high level of interest rates goes back to how the Fed is trying to calibrate this economy. The worry is that the Fed will not be cutting rates by May of next year, but rather probably by the third quarter or maybe even later. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramons, and Tom Keen on radio on television Thursday. Claims in this hour. Haven't even mentioned it today in 29 minutes. We did. Jobless claims. <laughs> I didn't hear it. Jobless <laughs> claims. I mean, I'm sorry. We're going to see this. Is, it, I can't. is this like I'm a big? Done. Is this like a big number today? Sometimes I feel like you don't listen to me. I don't oh, listen. Then to you. later okay. in the show, but, you confirm it. But <laughs> weekly data. Seriously, weekly data, retail sales, yeah. CPI, and everybody's going. Okay, what's the now? What I would center on. NVIDIA earnings next week. But I'm sorry, Walmart today in claims, this makes it a valuable Thursday. There are things that matter to the market. There are things that matter to this economy. NVIDIA earnings, given their outperformance this year, given the market cap, massive for the market when we get yeah. those earnings. Tough. Apple-like. The retailers, small and large, may be more important for the broader economy and the U.S. consumer. So let's yeah. pick a name. Walmart in the pre-market, down by something like 6% <clears> at the moment, just off session lows, coming out with numbers a little bit earlier. But ultimately, Tom, just a guide from them, not the numbers, the commentary on what's happening with the U.S. consumer. That's going to get the conversation going into the opening bout. But a weakness out there for Walmart. Chuck Graham, optimistic there at Gordon Haskett on Walmart. And again, Again, he says they're dominant, and I wonder if that's the theme. I'm not there yet, but the theme yet for 2024 is the dominance of select ginormous companies. And we've been seeing that, and that's the reason why some of these dominant companies are perhaps better reads on the real-time consumer appetite than even some of the lagging macro data. Just to build on John's point, this idea that consumers are pushing back on price. We heard that from Chuck Garam. We saw that with margin <coughs> compression in the United States at Walmart. And then the larger read-through of, okay, yes, they might have a really good uh, view in terms of consolidating business. They're seeing a more rapid drop-off in consumer appetite. That, I think, will get people's but can, can we fold that, guys, into a real GDP guess for next year? I'm hesitant to do that. It's tough, Tom. Because I, don't, I just don't have the set of data-dependent now or forward to, so I can go, in six months, <laughs> GDP will be 2.3%. I've got no basis. Tom, it's both the best and the worst thing about earnings yeah. season, that you can cherry-pick some companies and tell whatever story you like. Yeah. You can do that this morning. <clears throat> Across income groups, you can pick Walmart, and then you can pick out Burberry out of London and talk about even the high-end income story really starting to fade, Tom. The post-pandemic luxury boom is over looking at Burberry. You can make all of these different examples, Tom, but ultimately, that's why we're well, looking at claims this go, morning. That's why I'm going to claims to see if there's really that kind of weakness yes, coming through this labor market and claims are starting to break out a little in, bit more. In the parsing of, of earlier this week of Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, I think we all agree it's an unemployment call, a labor call that gets them to what the Fed will do. And part of that is the dynamic of claims, that the four week moving average and continuing claims as well. Goldman think we can continue this expansion, <clears throat> that we can get inflation back towards target without unemployment surging. Ultimately, if there's consensus on Wall Street, and Lisa and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, and I think it's important, there is this belief <clears throat> still that Lisa, even if there is an economic downturn, people are gonna hoard labor given their experience to hire people over the last few years. And that could cushion any kind of downturn because if people are employed, they're not going to feel that pessimistic and they will keep spending. <clears throat> what I'm trying to wrap my head around right now, and forgive me, I'm thinking aloud, as I often do on this program. That's the show, Lisa. Go <laughs> but I'm looking Go for it, it I'm thinking to myself, okay, if you see nonlinear changes in consumer appetite and Walmart signals that they are seeing a nonlinear change in the past 90 days, is that coherent with the soft landing that people are talking about. I don't know the answer to this, but this is I... what is sort of keeping people up at night, right? Are we looking at a change mm -hmm. with the long and variable lags as we parse hairs, as George Concalves said, 
that start <clears throat> to take effect in that yeah, nonlinear fashion. To go to the, to the wild side, if you get Ed Yardeni to SPX 5400 the end of next year, does that pop a 32 or 33 multiple on Walmart? Do you get a 10% multiple expansion on Walmart from 30 out to 33? Chuck Graham, he's in that camp, frankly. I love some of the calls on Wall Street. Goldman Sachs, 4,700. Not this year. Yeah. Next year, we're at like 4,500 <coughs> right now, Tom. Futures at the moment, negative 0.1% on the S&P. Pulling back just a touch. I've mentioned yeah. Walmart a few times. That name is down about 6% in the pre-market. Yields coming in about five basis points. This bond market is still all over the place, to be honest with you. The 10-year at the moment, 448.43. <coughs> the 10-year right now is exactly where it opened last Thursday yeah, that was great a week insight. ago. But you've yeah. got to keep coming back to that. All the volatility <coughs> in between. The narrative switching from one side of things to the other. This 10-year, Tom, is back to where it opened a week ago Thursday. Well, a week ago Thursday, I'm going to do a 10-day chart on what I'm looking at, and people are ignoring this in the West, the Western world, the far side of the world. Lisa, Euro-Yen, a 164. It's up four big figures over a cup of coffee or lovely tea. And the answer is the high at 3 a.m. this morning, 164.30. I call that untenable. Well, there's this question of what point the Bank of Japan yeah. quagmire breaks and what <clears throat> that does to some of the volatility well, that we've been seeing, certainly even in U.S. yields. Maybe it's off the chart, but that's what I'm watching. Euro yen right now in equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. Distilling this in a really wonderful voice of just how to frame out the 14 narratives we've been talking about is Michael O'Rourke. Decades of work with chief market strategist at Jones Trading. Michael, I've never seen it as crazy. I could not write an outlook now with great respect. How do you get out six weeks? But far more importantly, how do you frame an outlook out six months? I, I think that's, a, that's the key point here. Um, we're at this inflection point that people are unsure. Are we going for the soft landing or is the slowdown in inflation, the slowdown in economic data, is it going to lead to something larger? I start with what I know and what I believe is it, we can count on. I believe the Fed's done raising rates. I believe that part of the process is complete. So I'd be looking for names that are, you know, investments that benefit from that. That's why I think the banks and interest rate sensitive names like REITs, utilities, are probably safer bets. The problem is, is when we get a weak CPI, not even a weak, that we still have 4% 4, 4 core CPI. We still have an inflationary environment. But slightly better than expected number, the market automatically translates no more rate hikes to, OK, we're going to cut 100 basis points next year. Yep. And I, th I think that's the issue. It's just uh, it's a manic reaction that people just have to you know take a step back and look what they you look at the, the data they feel confident about. If the Fed cuts 100 basis points next year, that means we probably have a really significant economic slowdown emerging that you w you would not want to be aggressively buying stocks in. So I think you have to just go with what you're sure about and then let the noise just play out. Michael, it's difficult to do this on TV because the following question deserves a lot of thought, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. If higher interest rates didn't slow this economy down, do easing financial conditions speed it up? <laughs> <laughs> they probably do. They probably do. And but the, here's the question: like everyone, you know, has gotten excited about the Treasury rally, right? We're sit sitting here with a four and a half percent ten-year yield. This is where we were back in September when we first hit this. You know, it was the first time we hit 16-year highs a couple of months ago. We're still at very, you know, I don't want to say high yields, but high relative to where we've been for the past 15 years. So while financial conditions have eased somewhat. Um, a lot of that's the stock market rally. And I think, like, like I said, I think a lot of that's the noise. We're still at what, what I would say is an attractive bond market environment where if you could buy the 10 year at four and a half percent, that's attractive. And we know we still have a um, significant treasury issuance coming. Um, it's not like the rally in the bond market means treasury, you know, the, the profligate spending in Washington has ended and that, that issuance isn't going to materialize. So like I said, I think people have to kind of step back from the noise and you have to realize, um, you know, a lot of the things we're looking at are still the same. They didn't change in two weeks. Well, you said to uh, look through the noise and go with what you know. What, are you, what do you have conviction around in an environment where, as Wei Lee said, you blink and there's a new narrative? Well, I, I have conviction that the Fed is probably done and that their interest rate hikes are done. 
What I don't have, I would not have conviction about is the fact that the market believes they're going to start cutting immediately just because they're done hiking. And I think that's that's the issue here. If you look at the trends of where the, you know, the one month, three month, six, six month core CPI uh, annualized rates are, we're, we're still trending above three percent. And the Fed does have to get inflation back to two percent that, you know, they say is their job, number one. I think Chairman Powell did himself a disservice by dismissing uh, the set projections from the September FOMC meeting because that got the market excited that the Fed's going to cut rates earlier. But we need to get that inflation down. And we also need to do it without uh, creating you know, a, a significant downturn in the economy. And when we talk about the slowing data, whether it's the earnings, whether it's the economic data, like we have, you know, there, that's a risk. I think Powell has been on point that households and businesses borrowed at low rates, so they're well-funded for the time being, and that's kept the economy expanding. But that is likely a run out of room next year because rates are higher. And to your point about jobless claims, I think they're really important. You guys are talking about, like, if we see initial jobless claims tick above 250,000, that start, you, you know, you start, you start getting concerned there. And then when they move above 300,000, you get worried. Well, so I think those are things you want to keep an eye on. To that point, John and I were talking earlier about this sort of labor hoarding dynamic of this recovery. Can we get a clean read from these jobless claims? Well, I think you're right that jobless claims are going to continue. They, they are strong. They have been strong and they're going to continue to be strong for a little bit. Uh, but that's that's my you know, that's my signal that real weakness will have emerged. And we, we just don't, again, we're at this inflection point where we still don't know if it's a soft landing or a graded downturn. All we know is the data is cooling, the economy's decelerating, how quickly it just remains a concern. But I'll also sit there and say, we have the highest interest rates we've had in 16 years. The longer this environment persists, the more likely it is the slowdown uh, becomes, uh, you know, and, and the more severe it can become. That's the, that is one of the problems of having this easy policy for so long yeah. and allowing people to, to build those reserves up with, with low borrowing. And looking because ahead now, to claims in about 20 minutes, yeah. we'll be focused on that. Michael, we've got to leave it there. Michael O'Rourke of Jones Trading. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your time. If you're just joining us, futures right now, negative 0.1% on the S&P. Lisa, that question I asked, if higher rates didn't slow the economy down, Will easing financial conditions speed it up? Mark Dow out on Twitter, inspiring that one. I think that's a really interesting question. How asymmetric is that? It's a great question. I don't really know, right? We don't really understand the uh, vectors of monetary policy and the implication. There's also a question of what do we mean by monetary easing? Do we mean the stock market going up? And basically, what I've heard from Sounds a lot good of to people, me. well, what I've heard from <laughs> a lot of people is stocks will keep going up unless there's a recession, because ultimately people are still buying I... the American dream. Of stocks. I think the arch theory would be this titanic four decade fear of becoming unanchored. Are we unanchored? And that gets back to is it 2.0, 2.5, 2.x, dare I say 3.1% is the new, new? That's the raging fear. This is when you expect to see a divergence cross asset where bonds start to rally on some bad news and equities sell off. Yeah. I don't think we're there yet, Lisa, but it's one to watch in the coming months, if indeed you do get some weaker economic numbers. Does it come from some fundamental concern about a slowdown? And if it does, then it's not necessarily going to uh, lead to true expansionary types of, uh, of read-throughs in the economy. It's what are you be, looking at? It's a, it's, I'm looking at all sorts of stuff out there. I'm looking. This was beneath the radar in Here cocktails last okay. night after the champagne broke out. And, you know, it, they took a phrase from Bramo. You and I know Bramo is an envoy of friendship. <laughs> oh, without a doubt, She's yeah. an envoy of friendship. And there's the uh, leader of China. I'm a the panda. pandas will return. You're saying I'm a panda? The pandas will be envoys of friendship. You're the panda of Bloomberg surveillance. You make everything <laughs> likable. You are an envoy of friendship. <laughs> Roll around on the ground and sort of fall clumsily. I believe there are some of the most constructive and productive discussions we've had. I've been meeting with President Xi since both of us were vice president over 10 years ago. We've made some important progress, I believe. And Mr. President, after today, we do still look forward to President Xi as the dictator that Mr. Trump used earlier. 
Well, look, he is. I mean, he's a dictator in the sense that he, he is a guy who runs a country that is a communist country that based on a former government totally different than ours. The President of the United States speaking to the press after meeting with China's <coughs> President Xi Jinping, calling him, confirming that he thinks he is a dictator. TK could have been so much worse. He could have started that story about being in the foothills of the Himalayas. You know that one? <laughs> His favourite story? Isn't that Biden's favourite story? <laughs> I don't know. And he asked me, what's America? And I summed it up in one word. What did he say? Possibility. Something like that. It's his favorite story. All right, all right. The, the best part of the whole thing is looking at Tony Blinken's reaction. I know. When he said that, it's Front fantastic. Row. Front Absolutely. Row. Oh, we're going to go to AMA. It's like something out of Veep. He's yeah. like, oh, no. I, I, got a oh couple, really? I got a couple of questions for the qualified one. But to your point, John, what if he'd said that early in the meetings? True. <clears throat> at least it was at the end. That's why you sort of do those press conferences at the <laughs> yeah. end, right? Yeah. I know. Yeah. I want to talk about Walmart just briefly. The stock is yes. down 5.5 percent. Lisa picked up on this one, dropping across the Bloomberg. This quote right here that's coming from leadership out of Walmart. In the United States, we may be managing through a period of deflation in the months to come. And while that would put more unit pressure on us, we welcome it because it's better for our customers. Talk about the end <clears throat> of the post-pandemic pressures out there. Lisa, we heard it from Burberry this morning, who have basically said it's the end of the post-pandemic luxury boom. It's a big signal coming out of Walmart this morning. Margin compression and then potential outright deflation in the United States. Two questions. One, at what point are each of these retail stories idiosyncratic? And at what point is this sending a pretty strong message that, yes, the Fed may be done raising rates, but that what we experience might not be clean or potentially the strength that a lot of people were looking for in the bottom line of companies that have gotten bolstered. And Tom's been good about this, that have been bolstered by inflation and just the fact that revenues have been going up. I'm just shocked you're complimenting each other. That's wonderful. Futures on the S&P, Tom. Negative 0.2% on the S&P 500. Pulling back just a touch. Yields look like this on a 10-year, down four or five basis points. TK, 448.63. You know, the, McMillan's a self-made guy with a huge respect for his success in Bentonville. The board you just put up on radio, they put up the text folks of this deflation comment by the leader of Walmart. I can state this with certitude. There's not one single economist breathing that will tell you outright deflation is good for an economic system. They don't exist. It's in the textbooks. There's a fear. Gary Schilling codified this at Merrill Lynch. There is a fear of aggregate sum deflation, which leads to what, John, your grandparents lived in England, which is outright wage decline. That's the consumer pushback, maybe, Tom, that we're starting to see. Maybe. I mean, it's really early I, days, really early days. Yeah. I wouldn't draw too many conclusions from yeah. this, but certainly we're getting some questions out of Walmart, Tom, going in the Absolutely. Other that was a huge statement, and, you know, we'll have much more on that. Look for that across to the close this afternoon here on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Joining us now after a long night, Emery Horton, Bloomberg Washington correspondent. This from the Apex Summit in San Francisco. I guess, Emery, what everybody's going to pounce on here is does the apparatus of the White House walk back the president's statement? Will they or did they? Not really. What the White House is focused on is the fact that they, re they view this as a success. What we saw out of this meeting is very much small wins only. You have to remember, when you have a big summit like this, all these tiny deliverables, they're done and set. The final win is the two men meeting. And the point of this was that President Biden and Xi Jinping, after a year of not seeing each other, sat down. And, you know, one foreign diplomat that used to work in Asia said, this isn't about meaningful wins. It's about managing the relationship from getting worse. Biden has called <coughs> Xi Jinping a dictator before. He said, well, he is. And then mm -hmm. he explained why. He said, that is a different form of government than a democracy we have here in the United States. What will our commercial titans say to the president's comment as they dined with the leader of China last night? Well, Xi Jinping had a lot of dovish comments really yesterday, and I think we can interpret that as he really wants to assuage investors' concern, the business community's concern about how Gina Raimondo earlier this summer said that China is, quote, uninvestable. He wants to make sure that he puts a lid on that. He said he does not want to unseat the United States. He doesn't want a hot war or cold war with anyone. So he's trying to set the temperature at a lower level for the business community. 
Uh, and I think for the most part, they're going to shrug off what President Biden mm -hmm. said as he walked out of that press conference yesterday. And Ray, do we have any intel from those business leaders when they met with Xi Jinping about how comforted they were that there was a changing tone toward international businesses doing business in China? Not yet, but I think really it doesn't really matter what they say. It's going to be really in the actions. Are we going to see foreign direct, direct investment pick up? Are we going to see more business leaders, more executives want to go to China? and do business and set up more infrastructure and work in China. So I think really the next year or so, we need to see the actions of whether or not Xi Jinping was able to placate some of those concerns. Um, but at the moment, this really just felt like Xi Jinping's moment to address the business community. And because he was so dovish in these comments, it really felt like he was trying to forge a path forward with the business community. But remember, we've talked about this time and time again, he is dealing with a lot of economic issues and, and a fragile economic recovery from the pandemic at home. Michael Herson uh, was on earlier, a China analyst, and he was talking about how this is sort of the grace period before the rhetoric starts hardening significantly next year ahead of the election. What are we expecting? Where are the pressures right now, both within the Democratic Party, but just more generally within the populace about hardening the line with China? Well, it's a great point. I think it's part of the reason why Biden didn't shy away from calling Xi Jinping a dictator as his final comment when he left that press conference. He has been under the gun by Republicans, and he's going to an election year, that he's not tough enough when it comes to China. The fact of the matter is this administration, yes, they're engaging with China. Biden has said he wants to make sure it's he's managing this relationship so it doesn't veer into conflict. But at the same time, they kept the tariffs in place and they've added more penalties when you look at some of these export controls. But still, they'll, they will be pressured that they're not tough on China. I think it's one of the reasons why Biden wasn't shy from saying Xi Jinping is a dictator yesterday. But the rhetoric is certainly going to heat up the closer we get to November. I mean, you look at Congressman uh, Mike Gallagher from Wisconsin, who leads the China Select Committee. He was running a, uh, he was part of a protest over the weekend uh, against Xi Jinping coming here. And then he also wrote a letter and was kind of mocking all these CEO who he says paid $40,000 a ticket to sit at that dinner last night. Is that true, Anne-Marie? I didn't know that. I didn't either. Is, they actually had to pay to sit around that table. Well, this is according to Mike Gallagher, and, and he wrote a letter to organizers about how, why are we selling these tickets? Uh, I will come back to you with actual prices and what was potentially, um, what was what potentially this cost. But according to Mike Gallagher, who wrote this letter, this was a forty thousand dollar ticket, and as wow. we've written, this was the hottest ticket in town. M -H. People wanted to be able to have FaceTime with Xi Jinping. Thank you, Anne Marie, on the ground over in San Francisco, California. I think we'd love some clarity on that particular <clears> issue. <throat> Pushing ahead from here, jobless claims in about five, six minutes' time. The estimate for claims is about 220. The previous week was 217. We're going to look to see if that pushes higher. I want to go back to Walmart, which is down about 6% in early trading. I think the quote you're going to hear a lot this morning is this one right here. We may be managing through a period of deflation in the months to come. They've talked about a sharper slowdown in some consumer activity <clears throat> in some of the weeks in October and maybe sort of raising the question what this is going to bring us into year end. I'm going to ask this question to Mike Antipoulos of Richard Bernstein. We'll catch up with him at the Open in about an hour from now. Tony Rodriguez of Nuveen, Amanda Lynham mm, of BlackRock. These are questions, Tom, that I think a lot of people want answers to going well, into year uh, end. Uh, Amanda is absolutely perfect to address that. My, my basic idea, and I'm speaking quickly here ad hoc, is a three-month annualized moving average of negative price change on CPI or core CPI would be, would be just, it, it'd be thunder across the American landscape. It, it's frankly unthinkable. You know, we've seen it in other nations, in particularly during conflict, but in coming out of war, supply-side shocks, World War II and that, but it would be stunning. How much would you pay for a ticket? I'm sort of shocked by this. I think Lisa's up to speed on it. New York Post writes it up. That, yeah. Bloomberg has it, as Anne Marie said. Who gets the money? Who are they paying? That's the question. Who are they paying? Well, the conference organizer. It's a hell of an hour's divorce. Amazing. Non news day. No, it's not. There's actually a Seattle slew of economic data today all through the morning, and Michael McKee will provide 
leadership on that. Lisa, it's claims, it's weekly. Guess what? It's important. Especially given the fact that we're seeing some of the commentary out of retailers about softness. If there is some confirmation from jobless claims, do we see yeah. another disproportionate reaction in markets? And John Riding of Breen X Bear Stearns would say an import prices are important. Tom, the data falls, claims wander out. Ooh, in an elevated direction, we migrate to Michael McKee. Yeah, 231,000 initial jobless claims filed last week. That is uh, up from the initially reported 217. We're getting, uh, we'll get the uh, revision in just a moment to last week's numbers, but uh, 218. So not much change. So it is a significant increase of uh, about. Uh, 13,000 or so. Uh, the continuing claims number is 1,865,000, up from 1,833. I thought maybe we would see some of the continuing claims go down as the auto workers <coughs> went back to their plants, but that doesn't seem to be the case. So if you are looking for a story about the economy and the labor market getting a little softer, you might find it in this week's jobless claims numbers. Uh, the import price index comes in higher, much higher than anticipated up six tenths of a percent. Uh, X petroleum though down two tenths so it's kind of hard to separate that out because yeah. what we've seen is gas prices coming down, uh, oil prices coming <clears throat> down. So we'll have to look further into that. On a year-over-year -year basis, import prices are down 2%, two uh, 2%, which is more than had been anticipated and more than the 1.7% <clears throat> last week. And then we've got the Philadelphia Fed comes in. The uh, Philadelphia Fed uh, headline number is negative 5.9. That is up a little bit from negative 9 and prices paid comes in at 14.8 after 23.1. So a well, big drop in prices paid for the uh, Philadelphia area. Review that further, Michael. And there's a ton of data coming out this morning. Ellen Zentner to be with us momentarily. Lisa, I go right to the 10-year real yield, which is now testing the low inflation-adjusted yields of two days ago, the shock of 2.15%. We're not quite there yet, but the bond market readjusts immediately off this data. Yeah, I'm just looking at nominal yields and just uh, going much lower on the heels of some of this across the curve, not only a 10-year, but also two-year, sort of edifying this idea the Fed is done, taking a look at the labor market, starting to give way on the margins, Tom. I do wonder, uh, especially now with a two-year yield at 4.84% fluctuating around, are we looking at cuts? Are we looking at a real slowdown or are we looking at a normal and I special, especially with all of the retail sales, that's wow. going to be the key question this morning. I didn't realize a two-year yield really testing those lows we saw two days ago. I've got a low to four digits here of 4.8065, rounded to 4.81, and Lisa, we're three basis points away from that moment that was so shocking two days ago. So, Mike, just to give us a little bit more color, do we have a sense of how broad-based some of these claims are about how funky they are or if this really is highlighting the weakness that seems to be implied in markets, albeit on the margins, not cratering, but just yeah. maybe normalizing? It may be normalizing. Yeah, we don't have any uh, idea that there is anything wrong with these numbers, so it does look like uh, at this point that we're basically <clears throat> just seeing a few more people who are not getting jobs, and those who are not getting jobs are taking longer to find new ones. It's not a huge sign of an apocalypse in the labor market, but it does suggest that maybe the normalization process continues, which is what the Fed wants to see. Ten seconds, another wall of data today. What matters next across November 16th data? Uh, well, we've still got industrial production coming out. The problem with that is, is it's expected to decline because of the UAW strike. So you got to throw oh, okay. that out, unfortunately. <clears throat> A lot of Fed speak today, but really right. not on monetary policy. So I wouldn't expect much to change the market outlook uh, based on what I do. Well, we'll see. Michael McKee with us, and we'll continue through the morning on radio and television uh, with him. Joining us now, we're thrilled to have her, usually for big events. Well, today's a big event. It's always a big event. When Ellen Zentner joins us, Chief U.S. Economist at Morgan Stanley. Ellen, on claims, I go to the four-week moving average. How do you interpret claims with this 231,000 statistic? And can you say there's finally a vector in place of higher claims, more pain? So I hope that there's a higher vector in place. I disagree that higher claims would mean more pain. Um, we're coming off of extraordinarily low levels. 
Um, as you said, we look at the four-week moving average to smooth through volatility, and it has been lifting, but it is still very low. And so what does that tell me? Something that Mike and Lisa alluded to as well, normalization, slowing and normalization. Good God, man, that's what we've been needing. And I don't see this accelerating at an extreme pace. I've been on the road the last few days in several states meeting with corporate clients. They are they are finally seeing some relief in terms of how tight the labor market has been in terms of the availability of the kinds of employees that they need. We're seeing not just claims rising a bit here, but I focus on continuing claims. People that have been losing their jobs are staying unemployed for a bit longer, and that's been rising since October. So it's getting more difficult to just get reemployed right away. This is the kind of softness in the labor market that we have needed. And of course, it takes pressure off the Fed to raise rates uh, again, right, going on extended hold. What is the distance between normalization and an outright downturn? <clears throat> So, well, the difference is jobs stay positive. So normalization is you've got more supply coming back into the labor market. So you see participation rates rising, which we have. That is what puts upward pressure on the unemployment rate. And we've been seeing that. And if people are having taking longer to be able to get reemployed, then that should produce further upward pressure on the unemployment rate. But that just takes pressure off the labor market, pressure off of businesses, off of margins. You see wages grow, uh, grow more slowly, and you'll see confidence build among Fed policymakers that they have done enough here. Um, I don't think we're anywhere near getting to negative job gains. I think negative jobs would mean uh, that, um, that companies have stopped hiring. What I hear is that they're doing selective hiring, that they stop hiring and that they start firing. And I mean firing uh, broadly. And that's just not what we're seeing. But I, I'm ever watchful, especially reading earnings transcripts to see if that's something that's around the around the corner. I'm glad you mentioned earnings because we were talking about Walmart. And I understand there are idiosyncrasies here, but they talked about potentially seeing outright deflation uh, over the next year with consumers clearly pushing back. You do see margin pressure. You do see a marked deterioration in consumer appetite over the past 90 days. <laughs> How concerning is that to you about the nonlinearity of where things could be? So, Lisa, we, we put out a consumer survey that goes out into the field every two weeks. And one of the biggest areas of trade down that households have been doing is within stores themselves, say, going from a high price branded good to the generic good within the store. And that means that those retailers are going to see some deflation. And we've been hearing from businesses that input costs are falling but prices that they're charging are falling faster. And that's important because we all started to think, we, the economics community at large, not myself, though, an right. exception, started to think that households just have unlimited price tolerance. And that is not the case. Finances start to slow. We run through that excess savings and you will start to trade down. The lower income groups that Walmart serves are the groups that have been standing the greatest pressure. Look at delinquency rates for the lowest income groups mm -hmm. on credit cards, on auto loans. That points to stress. Ellen, Molly Smith and Alice Atkins for Bloomberg made a big splash the other day using your research, the Morgan Stanley View. And the key distinction is a 4.3% unemployment rate. I hereby dub it the Zentner 4.3% statistic. How do we get to a 4.3% unemployment rate that radically shifts Fed policy? Well, so I don't, I'm not expecting radicalism from the, the Fed. Uh, the unemployment rate at 4.3%, we think, is a soft landing unemployment rate in that it is driven by slower job gains and higher labor force participation. Now, I understand that is a beautiful scenario for the Fed. And we have them cutting right. next year by 100 basis points because of normalization. That's very different than cutting because the Fed thinks there's recession. If the Fed thinks that there's recession, they're starting big and they're doing a lot. That's then, very different than the normalization scenario. And then overlay with that what we're hearing Julia Coronado leading the way on this. Dr. Coronado suggesting productivity is underestimated. Do you believe that we have an underestimation of the efficiency of the American economy and that gets you to a benevolent 4.3% unemployment rate? 
Yeah, so I, so I do think that productivity is being underestimated. I would add, though, that productivity has not been well estimated ever. And so you'd have to say, well, it's it's being estimated, um, you know, worse than before. And I'm not sure we can say that. But I think there are a lot of new ways that productivity uh, exhibits itself in the economy that we're just not able to capture. Government data is not able to capture. Um, but absolutely, if productivity is higher, then you can withstand um, higher wage growth without it being uh, inflationary. It gives the Fed more runway because it keeps a lid on inflation. And so it's it's really, it lifts all boats. It's, it's productivity and infrastructure, what economists go to sleep at night dreaming about, Tom. Which is the reason why I, I think people are sort of hopeful that we're going to get that and we're going to create this soft landing and avoid something more challenging. I guess to wrap it all up, we've been talking all morning about the potential for deflation. Tom was talking about how difficult that is for any economy to handle. This was the word that Walmart used. But you're talking about normalization. How concerned would you be to see some sort of material deflation, not disinflation, deflation in certain good sectors that we have been seeing on the margins over the past couple of months? Yeah, so Lisa, good sectors, I'm not worried about at all. We Goods prices in the U.S. have been in deflation for a decade leading up to COVID. That's normal, right? We were importing a lot of deflation, but that's externally determined. You know, I would be very, very concerned about a deflation scenario in the U.S. for services, for domestically determined prices. For us to get to that broadly, you're talking about an extraordinary downturn on the yeah. magnitude of the financial crisis in 2008 that would get that kind of price declines, declines in the level of prices. Instead, I think deceleration is in train. I think it's going to be faster than the Fed is expecting. And I think I've, I've been really pleased. And I think they should be ple pleased, too, with the progress that we've seen. The Newtonian mechanics of Ellen Zentner of Morgan Stanley there and the dynamics of price change. Uh, Ellen, thank you so much for the brief uh, this morning. Lisa, I thought you did that really, really, really well. We're going to talk about this, pick this up here uh, in a moment. Just a quick data check here with uh, what we're doing better. Standard & Poor's 500 on a percentage basis, S&P flat. Lisa Bramitz and Tom Keene here uh, uh, this morning is we, we talk about any number of narratives and then the deflation. I thought uh, Alan Zentner really nailed the mass of change you'd have to see to get true price decline in America with our resiliency, with what the laureate Ned Phelps of Columbia would call our dynamism. We've avoided this, but it's seared into the memory of Europe. The distinction between the goods and the services sector just keeps widening and widening, and she really made that distinction well. The idea right. of goods deflation, which service we're seeing, sector deflation? But service sector Where deflation it would be much harder uh, to <clears throat> see, especially because the costs have gone up so much to pay for employees, to pay for all of these base goods. You're not going to see it so quickly passing along. <clears throat> I mean, have you I mean, eaten out recently? Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. It's like literally eating out of New York City has become no fun. I mean, that's the simple way to. Uh, Put it, what I find fascinating is the idea of the dynamic nature of the American economy and what the, those cautious would say, fueled by debt, fueled by stimulus. And so that fiscal oomph that keeps us going is that a money illusion of disinflation, inflation, or would we be in Japanese like deflation if we didn't have all that fiscal response this will, hitting us? This will certainly be part of the conversation next year uh, with the political outlook. I, I also think it's important to see, is what's good for the economy good for stock markets on the other side? Or is it kind of baked in? I don't know. I don't have a theme for next year yet. Send me an email, me, message me by semaphore. Send a carrier pigeon. What's my <laughs> theme for next year? I really, this late in the year, I usually have like three themes. I got zero. They'll change next week. Futures, they improve. Futures at negative three. Bloomberg's surveillance. Look at Walmart's numbers. They're up, you know, comp up five. Target yesterday down five. You know, um, you look at Macy's down, down six or seven here. Um, it looks pretty uniform. I think there's pressures across the board. It's not really like the high end doing well. You guys talked about Burberry earlier. We'll get more color from, from Nordstrom next week. 
Uh, I, I think it's pretty uniform across the board. So is it a slowdown or is it simply normalization? Chuck Ron there, a senior retail analyst at Gordon Haskett weighing in, talking about the potential for a normalization. We were just speaking with Ellen Zentner of Morgan Stanley, saying that what we saw, the uptick uh, beyond expectations baked into the market with jobless claims, also a normalization. What you see in markets is no drama, especially after a drama-fueled uh, week. We could see uh, basically flat on S&P futures, bouncing around, fluctuating between gains and losses. Euro uh, gaining once again 108.79. Ten-year yields. Look at that, Tom. An eight basis point drop as people consider jobless claims. Yeah. It really has been this ongoing ping-pong act. 4.4472. Lots to talk about here, but Lisa, you're dead on about the yield. Like, you know, people want some, oh, give me some more equity. I'm addicted to up 1%. I need, if the Russell 2000 doesn't go up 3% today, it's a failure. Forget about all that hype. hype. In the bond market, there's a subtlety here, and I'm literally, if I was writing a banner at 6 a.m., I'd say it's retest Thursday. Are we going to test new low in two-year, new low in 10-year? Dare I say new low, 2.17% in the 10-year real yield. That's more important than the damn stock market this morning. And it's because of jobless claims, and it's also because of some names within the stock market. I want to just go back to Walmart. We've been talking about it all morning. It came out with better than expected earnings, better than expected forecasts, albeit marginally so, but then comments around a rapid deceleration in consumer spending over the past 90 days. And also this line, in the U.S., we may be managing through a period of deflation in the months to come. Those shares down about 6 percent, target shares down in sympathy about 3 percent. Uh, and this has been a concern, even as Macy's <coughs> outperformed from a very low bar, how much this is a story throughout. But, Tom, it's not just the retailers, right? We're seeing other stories, too, on the margins underperforming. Yeah, we are. They're underperforming. You know, I think it's going to be interesting to see and, and, and tech as, as well. Lisa, you want to go all Cisco here. Why don't you bring in Mandeep Singh? You know, you got some, you got some things you want to, I don't care, but well, you know, <laughs> sure. a lot and, and fair enough, there are a lot of people who don't care. You love the pandas, you know, you're an envoy of friendship. Bring Do you in know Mandeep. Mean, gifts I got or gifs this morning of me as a panda rolling around after your comment? Well, you're an it envoy was, of friendship. Was, okay, moving on to Cisco and this question of consumer spending, but also business spending. Those shares significantly lower after reporting worse than expected earnings, seeing to potentially the biggest losses in 18 months. Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence, how much is this a Cisco-specific Cisco story and how much is this a broader retrenchment in business development, business spending, even in the hot artificial intelligence areas in cloud? Well, so that's where if you parse through the print, you can see Cisco is more exposed to traditional networking. And right now, every enterprise wants to invest more around generative AI, where NVIDIA not only provides the GPU chips, but it also has an InfiniBand networking component. So I think the Cisco print does throw into the fact that you know, IT spending overall is decelerating, but clearly enterprises have picked the areas where they want to invest in, and that's uh, the GPUs and the associated networking around it. I want to focus here at the NVIDIA. I don't know beans about NVIDIA other than I got one of their fancy chips and a fancy computer at home that I use uh, in music. I want to focus, Mandeep, on the NVIDIA earnings next week, which to me have an importance like Apple earnings or Microsoft, even though it's a much smaller company. Tim Bradshaw does a tour de force in the FT today on the NVIDIA A100 chip in the H100 chip, whatever it is, mm -hmm. and everybody's out there going, we gotta build the next NVIDIA. Can Microsoft succeed in cloning or improving upon the miracle known as NVIDIA? Well, so look at how uh, NVIDIA has built its data center business. It's over the last seven years, and now it's at a run rate of 50 billion. They were a gaming chip company, and they focused on ARM architecture really try to focus on providing something that is uh, not given by Intel CPUs. And I, I think what they have done is found use cases time and again, whether it was crypto right. and now uh, AI. I, I think Microsoft mm -hmm. core business is still public cloud. They want to be the Switzerland. They don't want to be in the business of making chips. Let me sum Ed Ludlow's work at Bloomberg Technology. What Bradshaw's doing over at the FT with the brilliant work of Anurag Rana and you at Bloomberg Intelligence. This is a technology chase. It's almost like the space program 
Do you have confidence that Microsoft, AMD, and the rest can succeed in cloning NVIDIA? Well, so from my perspective, you need three things uh, for Gen AI. You need the chips, you need the distribution, and you need the LLMs. What Microsoft what? LLMs, the large language model, whether it's GPT or BART or something. Yeah. Large language model is when Pharaoh gets angry at me because I talk too much. Continue. So I, I think what Microsoft has is the distribution. What Google has is all three of them. They have their own large language model. They have the distribution. And they are making chips as well. Microsoft's, I think, positioning is good right now because they partnered with one of the earliest ones to build that LLM, and they clearly have the distribution. I think building chips isn't the core focus right now, but clearly they want to hedge their bets. You know, Tom mentioned something earlier that I think is really apt, which is the winner takes all kind of mentality. Is that what we're seeing right now in the tech space, in the chip space, with the miss maybe of Cisco that's being heavily punished and the incredible success of NVIDIA as it consolidates its power. I mean, look at the kind of run that Intel had over the years after they had the CPU. They had a 25 year run and to date, they still have the 80% plus market share on the CPU side. It's just they missed it on the GPUs and that's where I feel because a lot of these training environments are standardized on NVIDIA, NVIDIA will remain the incumbent. There will be an ecosystem built around it. One more here for you. What are you actually going to look for from NVIDIA next week? Just uh, how are they looking to expand beyond the GPU chips? Because we know the chip business is very cyclical. There will be a digestion period. Do right they now, do guidance? Like, is there like, they, they do. We're going to do 2024, whatever guidance. And they not only beat and raise, they beat and raise by a lot, which is what has happened for the last two quarters. They raised their guidance by almost two, three billion. So clearly they have set a <coughs> High bar, but maybe they can to, top that again. To, to what Lisa mentioned here, and I go back to an arch essay by Michael Mabusi and at the time at Credit Suisse on this, and I'm not going to go into the electrical engineering of it, but it devolves down to very few people win. Is that what we're living with the Magnificent Seven, is what Mabusi and wrote about 20 years ago? I think given the scale of these companies and the distribution they have, Data is what is, uh, you need for AI. These companies all have a lot of data. And, and if you want to constantly train your models, be ahead in terms of you know, the AI aspect, these companies, the incumbents, right. have a clear advantage. Now, there will be somebody new who develops a use case. I think there will be more disruption on mm -hmm. the application side as opposed to the infrastructure side. Mandeep Singh, thank you so much. For My brain hurts. No, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point, though. Tough. The application versus <clears throat> the hardware, meaning that the chips are going to be a much higher bar to break I mean, into. I, but if you come up with some sort of chat GPT new version that has the programming that's that okay. much more brilliant to write your papers in high school, then great, it'll get adopted. We call that cliff notes. Thank you. <laughs> Here's chat GPT. I'm sorry, Mandeep, you know this. I'm nuts about the chips that are in here. Are these new NVIDIA chips, are they as dynamic as what we're seeing here? Are they like way beyond this? Well, clearly, uh, you know, a server chip is a lot more powerful than what is in your phone. And so clearly what NVIDIA okay. has done isn't scalable because we are talking about a chip okay. that's magnitude more powerful than what you have in your we phone. We gotta go, we gotta talk about Pandas. Yeah. Mandeep Singh, thank you so much. Pandas loving the bond market today. <laughs> I Someone mean, come on, seven out. basis points? I mean, okay. we got something going here. Some. One of our viewers pointed out that a panda is in fact a bear, so it actually does work. Uh, I, I although, is, are they actually bears? I'm gonna, I, I don't, are they nice? I, I, I mean, Steve Roach was the, at Morgan Stanley with Ellen Zentner, Steve Roach, he would go to Chengdu just to go, you know, climb up okay. in the mountains. If, if you are just joining the program, the reason why we're talking about pandas, it's the ostensible reason that we're looking at pictures of pandas is because Xi Jinping said that they would send new pandas to the United States for panda diplomacy after removing the other ones and, you know, seeing uh, the boxes as they sort of were shipped off, you know. This is like an there. outtake from Blue Eyed Samurai. Oh That's God, what it looks why like are we to doing me. this? On radio, <laughs> our like sympathies. We had to do panda shots. It boosts ratings. I mean, what can I, what can I say? <laughs> the panda lobby is. We're wrong. your envoy of friendship. If you choose, <laughs> stay with us through the day, and then tomorrow, tomorrow, Mohammed Alarian scheduled to be with us. Coming up on Bloomberg Television, U.S. Ambassador to Japan, Ram Emanuel.